Moment. And President Viasquez, it is 6.30. We'd like to welcome everybody. And the recording is started if you would like to begin the meeting. Perfect, thank you, Mr. Allen. I call the meeting of the San Juan Unified School District Board of Education to order. The meeting is being audio and video recorded and the recording may capture sounds and images of those attending this meeting. The recording will be posted on the district website. Presenters will participate via the Zoom platform and public attendance is provided via the Zoom platform as well as a live stream on the district's YouTube channel. We thank you for joining us and ask for your patience as we use this format in an effort to maximize access and participation during this time of social distancing and other restrictions. At this time, please stand for the virtual presentation of the colors by the Casa Roble Fundamental High School Air Force Junior ROTC. Color guard, attention, hut, for harms, forward, harm. Color guard, halt, ready, case. Ready, case, reason, harms. Ladies and gentlemen, may you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Order, arms, ready, case. Forward, heart. Good evening and welcome. I'm Paula Viesca's board president. Joining me tonight is Dr. Michael McKibben, board vice president, Ms. Zima Creason, board clerk, and Ms. Pam Costa and Mr. Salt Hernandez, board members. Superintendent Kern and other staff members are also in attendance. Before we begin, I'd like to review the two methods that are available to submit public comment for tonight's evening, tonight's meeting. The first option is to submit a public comment online using the comment form located on the district website at www.sanjuan.edu slash board meeting. If you wish to submit a public comment on more than one agenda item, please submit a separate form for each item on which you are commenting. Comments received by 6 p.m. today have already been shared with all board members. Comments received after 6 p.m. tonight, including those submitted during the meeting, may be read during the meeting depending on time restrictions. Comments may only be submitted on an agenda item up until the time that the agenda item has been discussed. The second option is on the Zoom platform where you may use the raise your hand feature when you are called on. You may share a comment via audio during the meeting. Please note that all public comments are subject to a two minute limit or approximately 1500 characters. With that, we are at approval of the minutes, um, item B. Are there any corrections to the minutes? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve the minutes for January 26th? So moved. It's been moved by Ms. Costa. Is there a second? Second. It's been seconded by Ms. Creason. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 That was unanimous. We are now at item C1, High School Student Council Reports. 
Tonight, we will hear from student representatives from El Camino Fundamental High School and from Encina Preparatory High School. Welcome to our students. Thank you very much for being here. And let's begin with Soraya Matthews from El Camino. And Soraya, please correct me if I mispronounced your name. You said it correct. <laughs> Thank you. Great. So President Viasquez, is did I pronounce that right? You did and great, then, yes. <laughs> thank you, members of the board, Superintendent Kern and Ms. Cunningham. I'm Sarah Matthews. I'm the Associated Student Body Vice President from El Camino Fundamental High School. So first of all, I just wanted to say that we are so proud of all of our students and staff for working so hard this past school year, and we can't believe that it's already February. This coming month is quite busy for El Camino students. Starting off, our GSA club is hosting a virtual movie night on February 12th at 4.30 p.m. They're hosting this movie night via Zoom and are hoping for lots of participation. Since February is also Black History Month, we are trying to connect and celebrate with our students through Instagram. This, the class social media accounts post informational posts about influential Black people from that we learn in school so we can learn a little bit about their experiences through history and why they're so important. Um, the social media accounts are also asking students what their favorite Black-owned businesses are so that we can promote them and support them. Our student government members running these accounts are working very hard to make sure that this month receives the acknowledge it deserves. Our yearbook class has also been working very hard to collect many year memories and photos for this year's yearbook. They have been going out of their way to contact as many students as possible in order to help their memories and experience be shared in, and represented in such an interesting yearbook by sending out surveys, asking for pictures, emailing home, and contacting students individually. Yearbook has also put together senior nominations, which has been lots of fun for our students. The students themselves have been very active in advertising for their fellow classmates, either to vote for themselves or their friends for each category. Following that, nearer to the end of February, we are planning on our virtual Mardi Gras celebration. We will have a virtual rally, which includes many different students, a virtual dance, which we broadcasted on our radio station, KYDS 91.5 FM, which is all student run, and that'll be on Feb Friday, February 26th. Everyone is welcome to tune in and listen to the fun music. The week of the dance, we will have virtual spirit days every single day leading up. The spirit days will be monochrome themed using the Mardi Gras colors, yellow, green, purple, and black. The odd day will be an EC gear day, hoping that students will dress up and wear their favorite EC gear. The way that they represent their spirit wear is they send in pictures to class accounts, or they post on their Instagram stories or their Snapchat stories of them in their fun outfits. We are super excited for Mardi Gras season and although it looks very different this year, we're hoping that the students enjoy it as much. In addition, one of our students has started a donation and fundraiser service project that is collecting goods and unwanted or used items to send to Fiji, which has just experienced a hurricane. The school itself has been very active in helping her with this project and promoting it. If you would like to donate, you can contact me after this meeting and I can put you in contact with our student who is running this fundraiser. And then in the past two weeks, our academic decathlon team has had their competitions. There were two days of competitions and they, it was completely virtual and the award ceremony is going to be this coming Thursday. We're very proud of them for working so hard in these conditions, especially since it was very, very hectic with lots of tech technical difficulties, but they persevered and hopefully were, they did well. And then last but not least, the student government um, classes are selling class t-shirts for the second time this year. Sales are going well and having class shirts, I think personally is a very nice way of feeling almost normal again and more connected to our classes and school. Thank you so much for your time and for listening. Thank you for joining us and for your report. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues for any questions. Um, Mr. Hernandez. No questions, thank you so much for the report. Ms. Costa. No questions, thank you very much. Ms. Creason. Thanks so much for the report and I would love the info for the fundraiser and a link to the black owned businesses list. That's pretty awesome. Um, the links that we put on our black owned businesses are you can find them on our Instagram, which is um, ECSG, I think, or if you look up El Camino student government, we post 
a whole bunch of different black businesses that you can go and support. And then what was the other thing that you said? I'm so sorry. I forgot. A link to the fundraiser for Fiji. Oh, it's not a particular link, but um, if you go to El Camino's bulletin, daily bulletin, it should be in there. And her name is Della Baldwin and her information should be there. Or I can um, email you personally with her information. Thank you Thank so you. much. Dr. McKibben. Soraya, what, what is the uh, film you're going to see uh, on film night? Um, I can't remember. I was told today what the film was going to be because I'm not personally in the club. But um, I think it starts with a V. Oh, it's like Vendetta, I think. It's like Vendetta, Vendetta. I don't know that one. Yeah. I'm not sure exactly because I'm not personally in the club. But I know that the entire club thought that it would be a pretty good movie that they could all everyone would enjoy. Okay, thank you. I had the same question, but um, also just want to thank you for your report. Um, I, you made it sound all very easy and like it was all going really, really well. And I know behind um, that fantastic report is just a lot of work to continue to keep your peers, um, you know, again, that feeling of belonging to a class and just, you know, engaged at school. So I know that doesn't come, you know, it's not easy, it takes work. And so I just wanna say thank you um, and to all of your colleagues and your peers as well, uh, much appreciated. Um, I know particularly as we kind of continue in this instruction um, model, it doesn't, it's not getting any easier as we get into the spring. So just wanna say thank you for all of your efforts and really appreciate your report. Next up, we have um, Andrea Galvan Duenas from Encina. And Andrea, please feel free to correct me if I mispronounce your name at any point. Hi. There you are. Hi. Hi. Good evening, President Velasquez, members of the board, Superintendent Karen, and Ms. Kim here. I'm Andrea Galvan Duenas from Encina Preparatory High School. Like most students, I feel distance learning has not been ideal, but we understand that it is all for our safety. We get our hopes up every time we hear we will be coming back to in-person learning only to be disappointed when we find out it won't be possible. But recently, seniors went on campus to purchase caps and gowns in case we are able to have an in-person graduation ceremony. Students are happy to see each other for a quick minute, even if it was with COVID regulations. This has been a tough journey, but we are definitely getting the hang of it. Moving on, academics is something a lot of students have struggled with, trying to maintain their grades and their attendance. But thanks to our wonderful teachers and staff, we have tutoring for different subjects and Saturday school to help with attendance for seniors to be able to meet their graduation requirements. For athletics, we are still waiting on the past to be able to come together and practice. Last we heard, volleyball was getting ready to start their season. Our athletes are anxious and excited to play the sports they are passionate about once again. I hope everything goes well and they can kickstart their season. Although being home is an obstacle for events and activities, we have found ways to make things at home a bit more fun. For example, the week of January 25th through the 29th, we had a spirit week for the theme being Encina Theater, which included fun spirit days like dress up like your favorite character from a movie and TikTok birthday. Students submitted pictures and videos from the spirit days to our school Instagram, Encina underscore Bulldog. You can see the pictures and videos of the spirit week under the highlight Encina Theater. All classes had a social event on Zoom where their grade got together and were able to do an activity. We are also having a Valentine's Day art party on Wednesday the 10th on Zoom and would like to invite all board members to come. Thank you for letting me speak on behalf of Encina Preparatory High School. Thank you very much for joining us and for your report. At this time, I'm gonna turn it to my colleagues for any questions, Mr. Hernandez. No questions, thank you Andrea for the report, appreciate it. Ms. Costa? I echo Mr. Hernandez, thank you so much for your report. Ms. Creason. Thank you for your report. It was great. And I really appreciate you sharing the challenges along with um, the positives. You know, it is good for us to hear that. And I continue to be sorry that you guys had to, something you said really stuck out to me is, well, we got used to it. And I'm really sorry you had to get used to it. Um, so I hear you and I'm sorry. And thanks for hanging in there. And I'm really inspired by all the creativity that's going into creating community, uh, given the worst circumstances. So I applaud you for that. And I would love a link to the art party. Thanks for your report. Dr. McKibben. 
Thanks, no questions. Thanks, Andrea. I just wanna um, say again, thank you very much for, for joining us. And I do have one question, which is just like, is there a prerequisite skill level for the art party? Cause so I don't wanna <laughs> embarrass myself in, in any way if I were to show up. It sounds like it's a pretty easy going place. Is that the case? That's pretty simple. You just bring your like some art supplies and then we'll just guide you along the way. Okay, well, we'll see what I can conjure up. I'll, I'll take a look at my calendar. Uh, okay. But, you know, thank you very much for being here and and for reporting out um, similar to my remarks with our student representative from El Camino. Um, again, you know, I'll make it sound like, you know, creating community online is easy and I, just, I know it's not. I mean, um, it's just, it's, it's a lot of extra work and it's still just not the same. So, um, you know, please know that we're all still um, working and hopeful for a positive spring. But in the meantime, thank you very, very much for all of your efforts that you continue to put in and for joining us for the evening. And um, we really appreciate you being here. Student voice is very important to the board, you're certainly welcome to stay for the remainder of the meeting, but um, if you would like to get to homework or anything else that you have to do, um, we totally understand and also um, invite you to, to take on those items as well. So thank you very much to both of you for joining us. President Viasquez, can we clap for both of our speakers? We certainly can, absolutely. And with that, that concludes item C1. So we are now at item C2, staff reports. Superintendent Kern. Thank you, President Vasquez, members of the board, staff and community members. <clears throat> Tonight I wanted to provide um, an update on a variety of uh, facets related to uh, COVID-19, um, some of the guideline changes, some of the things we've been doing the last couple of weeks and then finish up with some updates around sports and graduation. I did want to start off by letting the community know we will have an agendized item, the first item on our February 23rd meeting. So that will be an item where we will have an opportunity um, based on really talking about the safe plans to reopen, but two weeks time, a lot can change. So we'll see what happens. So specifically what we address, uh, likely that we won't have a PowerPoint out before that because there will be a lot changing potentially, um, but we will have a presentation to the board with an opportunity for the community then to interact with the board as well. You know, throughout the last 11 months, we continue to see cha changing dynamics as well as changing guidelines. We did reach agreement with our bargaining partners on a plan to return uh, once we were in red. That, that took place back in November. We came to that agreement. The agreement was once we were in the red tier, which at the time was the, the guidelines that we had said that we would return once we were there for two weeks. Uh, I did want to share that if you're following what's happening throughout the state as well, you're hearing that a number of possible labor groups, um, even at the state level, are now making additional demands in terms of a requirement that all uh, employees be vaccinated. And I wanted to just share with the board as well as the community, our, our labor partners have not gone back on the agreements that, that we've had. They have committed that they are going to hold true to that. And if we get into the red tier, um, they have committed that they will return whether or not they have the vaccine or not. Now, individual employees may make a different decision, but as a bargaining group, that is a commitment that they have made. <clears throat> Changes that I did want to call out from January 14th when guidance kind of changed. So we want to clarify some of that. Originally, a district could apply for an elementary waiver. There is no longer the opportunity to apply for an elementary waiver. Um, we've been asked that question, why are we not? That's not even part of the new process. K-6, and I want to make sure this is really, really clear. The governor's plan and the plan to return only from California Department of Public Health, K-6 can return in purple once the case ratios um, are below 25 per 100,000. And I will share today, we hit 24.8. So today is the first day that we actually fall into that tier where we could bring back only our elementary students. Currently, the only way we could bring back anybody beyond elementary 
would be once we're in the red tier. There has been no changes on that. So the guidelines that we really were following when we got our agreement are still the same guidelines for secondary students. Uh, it, there is a change in the requirements. Before there were some guidelines about six feet apart. There was even some for those schools that were already in uh, in school, in person learning, they could have gone to four feet. The new guidance from CDPH as well as Cal OSHA is a requirement of six feet. We've gotten a lot of questions lately, you know, couldn't we open full time? And I'll speak a little bit more to that, but that is in the guidance now that you need to have six feet of space in those classes. Um, the determination, and this is really clear because when the county, the county data is very different from the state data. The county data, if you go look on Sac County, public health and their dashboard. Um, that data is probably four to seven days kind of behind. And so the, the rates are like right now today, they're at 19.1 where the state just has us at 24.8. In order for us to have been able to even consider reopening, and even when we get to the red tier, it's based on the state dashboard at this point in time. A lot of people, as soon as that hit uh, below 25 on that county site, thought we were able to do that. That's not the case. Um, I think a similar confusion may take place as we get closer to red for secondary. I will tell you that there are many of us in the state that are having conversations with folks downtown about potentially seeing if there are other indicators, maybe more that county indicator that we could use. Again, as we continually see changes in the guidance, we're not sure whether or not that would change. <clears throat> We've had questions about when the district would be able to return to full time, like five days a week, everybody here. That's really hard for us to answer because based on the guidance right now, we would not have the capacity um, within our district to abide by the guidance from Cal OSHA as well as CDPH. Um, so not sure about that. I did wanna share with you just today, there were some announcements and headlines about the governor and the legislator rumored to be working on a new plan and guidance. So again, what that will look like, um, I was reading an article this morning out of the Bay Area that says Governor Gavin Newsom says the administration and the legislature are close to making a deal on when and how to reopen schools. Uh, an agreement could be reached as early as this week. So we have the potential again to have whatever guidance and guidelines that we were given on the 14th changing again. So we'll be watching really what that what happens, what comes out of downtown in the next couple of days um, that could in, impact our next moves. Uh, some of the questions that board members shared with me that I wanted to hit on as well as one of them was, why are we not mirroring neighbor districts plans and are any districts in Sac County open for full time in person? I want to be clear in Sacramento County, our plan actually looks like the vast, vast majority of all the rest of the school districts in Sac County. I think people are really confusing what's happening in Placer County, and we may border Placer County, but Placer County has always been in a different place than we have. They had businesses that were open when we weren't. Um, they've been able to do other things based on their case rate. So in Sacramento County, currently, there is only one district that I'm aware of that's Folsom Cordova that has their elementary students back. There are no districts that are that are in place full, everybody back five days a week in person. Um, many of the agreements at other districts were, were negotiated based on the guidance we had back in the fall, look very similar to ours. Return in red once they're there for two weeks. Um, again, I have the opportunity every Tuesday morning to be on a call with all of the superintendents in the county and those those, those agreements look very similar across the board. Um, what are we doing this fall? So that's a question we get a lot of. And I have to say to folks, we absolutely are looking to the fall, but our start of school is six months away. And in COVID time, we can see massive changes in two weeks, four weeks, six weeks. We see new variances. We have no idea what's gonna happen with um, case rates. So I can't make any commitment. I can't say what we're doing in the fall. And I know a lot of people want to know, we are committing to staffing our schools as if all students return so that we have adequate staffing at our schools. Uh, we will still allow options for homeschool, for distance learning, for independent study. We will make sure those are staffed appropriately as well, but we want to staff our schools first and foremost. Our real focus right now is over the next four weeks, 
two months, three months, four months as we as we finish out the school year. Last summer, we had plans to return to a hybrid model. Um, and right before we were getting close to returning, the governor closed down all schools in the district. I would say it's my intent and the board's intent and hope that when we get to the fall, that the conditions are in such a place that we can return to five days a week and have learning that we're all used to. Uh, we've launched the expansion of a couple programs that I wanna talk about. We launched an expansion of our in-person special education for our mild and moderate students. That happened last week. This week, we launched limited bridges in-person programs. So we have some really focusing on our foster youth and homeless, some additional supports there. Related to the vaccines, I think a lot of people think that educators are already getting vaccinated. And in Sacramento County, they're not. And I have to tell you, it's been a real frustration. It's been a frustration for me. I know it's been a frustration um, for our board as we see other educators and other counties surrounding us actually already being vaccinated. Again, we have been working with the county on this uh, for the last couple of months, really coordinating this. Um, we are seeing limited numbers of vaccinations available. We do believe that educators who are in 1B uh, should start getting vaccinated next week. We are working with Dignity Health as well as other local care facilities to possibly um, provide vaccinations even at our school sites for our staff, but in our community as well as hopefully next week, places like Cal Expo and other larger centers will be able to start um, vaccinating our staff as well. We believe that to fully vaccinate all of our staff that will probably take place through the end of March. We are prioritizing all staff that work directly with students first. So folks that work at schools or who transport students. So that would be all our clerical staff, our support staff, custodial, um, our teachers, our aides, our administrators that work on staffs, bus drivers. Those would be in our mind, the first group that we would wanna see prioritized. And those of us like district office staff and others would be in kind of a second tier. We wanna make sure that all of those people that directly interact with students day to day are the first to be vaccinated in our district. Wanted to give an update on athletics. Um, we did announce today that athletics are coming back online. All teams can condition with the approved safety plan, cross country, golf, swimming, and track and field can compete. And then more teams can come online as we get to the less restrictive tier. So we'll continue to update that. Um, the governor in his presentation today at Levi Stadium even addressed the conversations they're already having around athletics. And as we heard some of the students address graduation, graduation is something that we are having conversations about. Um, our default planning is really to have an in-person graduation. Now we know that that might not be able to happen as we've had it historically with thousands of parents and all the students. So we're looking at other creative ways that we can do that. I was just having a conversation with Assistant Superintendent Messer tonight about that as well. Some of the various different options, looking at some of the conversation schools, having maybe even centralizing it at one site to make sure that we know all the guidelines are being supported uh, around distancing and whatever else we would be required. But our default will be to provide some in-person graduation. I think that's really important. As I talk with my superintendent students advisory council, uh, that's been a real topic that we've been discussing. Uh, they provided some great input as well. So with that board, I will finish my comments and take any comments or questions from you as well. Thank you, Superintendent Kern. I'm gonna next turn it to my, my colleagues, um, Mr. Hernandez. Thank you so much, Mr. Kern, for that report. First, I would like to thank all that reached out concerning this topic. I too was hoping, praying that the state would allow us to give us something to return under our current agreement. However, I feel we are past on that and relying, past, I'm sorry, I feel that we were past on relying on the state and we are at a point now that we need to do all and everything we can to get our kids back as soon as possible. Even if that means our K through six kids first and hopefully our secondary will follow thereafter. I am hoping that we can work together with all parties to make this happen. Districts that surround us have returned to in-person learning and we too must return to in-person learning for our kids as soon as possible. 
I'm very optimistic about the athletics. I feel that's very important for our kids, but I think it's time for us to do again, to do what we can work with our labor groups and to get our kids back in school as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hernandez. Um, Ms. Costa. I just wanna thank Mr. Kern for his presentation. I think that that answered many of the questions that I've been asked both personally and the whole board has been asked uh, by members of the community. And I think that's very important. The more communication we have, the better. I keep watching the numbers just like everybody else does and praying that we will get people vaccinated. People will continue to wear masks and follow all of the guidelines and we'll round the other side of this corner. Thank you. Ms. Creason. Thank you. I do have a few questions and a couple of points. And thank you, Superintendent. You did address a lot of questions that came from PD and that I had. And I'm glad they're going to be recorded in a minute until we can refer back um, as questions continue to come up. Um, I want to make sure I understand correctly that as of now, and this is just brand new, hot off the presses today at noon. We, could, we are allowed by the state and the county to open up for K through six, is that correct? Yeah, we could. Um, it, it, we would need to go back and negotiate that um, because right now our current settlement doesn't do that. I will share, we have been having conversations um, about variations, you know, certain timelines, um, but we would have to go back and completely re, re, uh, reopen up negotiations in order to get that agreement. And I think that's an important um, point to make and highlight is we as a board can open up all day long, but if we don't have staff to show up, um, what does that mean? Um, okay, and it, do I understand correctly that 7 through 12, according to state guidelines, state and county guidelines, still have to wait till in the red? Correct. We, we How can, long in the red? I'm sorry. Well, it, it's the guidelines change to it. You could be there only five days in the red. Our current agreement is is uh, two weeks. Uh, again, we had conversations this week and I don't wanna get into too much detail because it is part of kind of our back and forth conversations about making some modifications to that and when we would notify people based on potentially what that county number is. Got it. But you're correct, um, secondary cannot come back until we are in the red. Okay. Um... And I think a point of confusion is, are we basing decisions on state or county guidance? Um, so can you just expand upon you know, how that works a bit and what is the discrepancy between the two? Yeah, so when you look at the, the county dashboard, which changes every, almost every day, um, usually doesn't change over the weekends, but it, it will often be updated every week. It was, it was 19.7 on Monday, I think, um, Today it was, or maybe that was last week, it was 19.2. Yesterday it's 19.1. It was going down pretty rapidly, but it, it's kind of slowed now, which is unfortunate. The, the state only upstate, up, updates their number every Tuesday around noon. So last week we were at 30. This week we're at 24.8. They're, they're a little behind that real number that we have at the county, which isn't even up today. I think the number at the county was from the fifth or sixth. Uh, and so that state number is what we have to go by. So think about like opening businesses, the, the, the businesses and opening of let's say gyms or certain things, restaurants or other things that could happen in red. It won't happen when the county is, it'll happen when the state kind of says reauthorizes you're now in red um, based on that. And Trent, that is correct. I wanna make sure he reinforces that I hit that correctly. Thank you for that. And I think one point of confusion on that too is in the agreement, it refers to the county, um, the county's red tier, not the state red tier. So I could see why people have questions about that. Um, okay, I got a couple of more. Bear with me. Uh, just something I want to call out for the community for folks that may not know, our county chose to put educators in line at a lower tier um, than other counties chose to do so educators are higher up on the vaccination list in other counties than our county chose to do um, and I just want that you know folks in the community to be aware of that um, 
I know tonight, later tonight, we're going to be talking about learning and learning loss will be discussed. And I hope that part of that conversation will be, you know, what are we going to do to catch them up? And, you know, is there going to be some grace in the coming year for folks to, you know, for our kids to have some time to catch up and kind of relearn what they didn't, but we'll come back to that. You know, um, I, I can't mm -hmm. speak to that. We are having conversations um, and we'll probably come to the board with this, even about potential modifications for graduation requirements. I know they're even having that conversation at the state level. We actually have a meeting with a number of bargaining partners tomorrow, um, our administrators and our teachers association around learning loss mitigation, where we're all coming together as well and having that conversation. So they may speak a little bit to that, but those are ongoing conversations um, that, that we are having. Thank you. Um, help me make, tell me if I'm understanding this correctly. Really, the magic key to get to more kids on campus faster, so moving away from hybrid, really is dictated by, is it the state or county or both guidance on capacity, distance, et cetera? It's really um, based on the guidance from, uh, you know, right now Cal OSHA is a part of that, the California Department of Public Health. Um, you would, may have guidelines related even to CDE, but those, the guidance there is what dictates what we're allowed to do. We couldn't just freely open everybody up. We wouldn't get a, a plan like that approved through the county. We will actually, when we go to open up and we've, we've got plans that we're working on, um, but that would have to be whatever it is authorized by the county as well. Um, our current agreement that we have with and our models those have been approved. Uh, so if, if we were in red, let's say theoretically we went to red tomorrow and the clock was started, we would say we're gonna be back in two weeks. Okay, that's helpful and that's a great segue into my next question. When you look at the agreement, um, it reads, the district will provide a minimum of two, week, two work weeks notice and, and at least two additional Wednesdays to prepare beyond those identified above prior to the implementation of the hybrid model. And I think that's causing confusion too about, okay, when does the two weeks start? Uh, is it the county number, if it's the state number, is there a, an additional two weeks notice um, that would be given? Can you speak a little bit more to that? Yeah, so when, when we made this agreement, um, the guidance that we had was once a county, based on the state numbers again, so once the state said you're in red, then we would be able to come back two weeks. So in our minds, we said, okay, once we get to red, we're gonna let teachers know, we're gonna let the community know we're back in two weeks. The Wednesdays that we talked about would have been those two Wednesdays in those two weeks leading up to it that we would have utilized to come back. So, uh, you know, and again, these were, this were all the guidelines that we had at the time when we negotiated this. Um, and again, I'm, I'm curious, I'm really curious to see if what the governor and the legislature come out with either later this week, whether they change what we're currently looking at, I, they could, the governor made a comment today about the importance of K2. Is he going to do something just about K2? Uh -huh. I, it made me speculate and wonder. Um, so again, the, the, the guidance, you know, we're kind of chasing whatever um, changes at times. And do I remember correctly that the uh, the idea of two weeks in the red for moving into hybrid was based on county or state? And I'm sorry, I don't know which one at the time of the agreement. So it was in line. It, we didn't just make it up or nobody just made it up. It was based on the guidance. Do I remember that right? Yeah. And that's why I think, you know, when you when you look at an agreement in Elk Grove and you look at an agreement in Twin Rivers and you look at an agreement on Natomas and I don't know that Sac City has an agreement yet. They all look the same. They all say, once we get to red, we come back in two weeks. Because at the time we negotiated all of this, that was what we were following, that they wanted to make sure that a, that a, a county didn't just barely tick into red and then fall right back out. Okay, and now it's, okay, got it. Now the guidance is you, you could return I believe it's after it's five days or a week. I'm not a hundred percent sure on that. Um, but let's, let's say a week that you could potentially return in a week. Okay. Okay. Um, I, so a couple of statements and thoughts. I, it's totally reasonable that teachers didn't want to return 
in purple. I mean, we've all been told, you know, this is a dangerous spot to be. Um, it makes perfect sense that the workforce wouldn't want to return to that to keep, to keep themselves safe. I think that it's really important that we continue to follow the state and county guidance and let that guide our way. None of us are um, scientists or doctors, although we have President Viesquez that is um, the expert health person. And so I don't want to diminish that, that credential, um, but we're not doctors, right? And so I, I'm very dependent and I trust the state. I feel like that's what we have to align to, um, to do our best to keep folks safe and um, open. <laughs> and as we know, as you, as you pointed out, according to the guidance, we can open K through six right now. So I think it's time to revisit conversation. I'm glad to hear that conversations are happening, um, but in line with the guidance, we can do this. So we should do this. We can, should continue with the wonderful precedent that we have set is to follow the guidance. Um, and I, I encourage us all to do that throughout, including when we go back and it's hybrid and moving out of hybrid. Um, to really be in line with that. And I would hope that future agreements can be written in that way as we, and I know we know so much more now that we didn't know months ago, right? It's evolving and we're all learning as we go, but because we know guidance changes so much to maybe use language that allows us to shift with the guidance without having to renegotiate. Um, I can't speak for SJTA, but it's my understanding that, you know, that's the whole point is to just really um, trust the science and I think that'll allow us to do so as things change. So just a thought. Um, we got a lot of feedback about communication. Um, I know folks wanna see regular agenda items and I'm glad to hear there's gonna be an agenda item next week. I know over the months we have pulled out um, aspects related to reopening or COVID or distance, um, but you know sometimes that's not super obvious that that's what we're addressing. And I don't think that uh, sometimes we're not getting to what everyone wants to discuss. So um, I'm really glad that we're going to have an item tomorrow, but I also wanted to say for community, um, even if it's an item, you still get two minute public comment. So we may want to explore other avenues for communication. Um, maybe it's an and, I don't know if it's an or, but we could talk that out um, so that there is um, more communication and that allows more dialogue as we move, move, th move through this and we know things are moving fast. And so we need to figure out how, how to talk more. Um, I am really concerned about a rift that's building between our teacher and parent communities. Um, I know it's hard for everybody and I really do believe everyone's doing the best they can. I won't insult anybody um, and I won't overly criticize. Um, and so I'm just, I'm going to, ask that we all try to remember that we're all in this for the kids, the parents and the teachers. And, you know, they do better when we work together better. I know that's challenging. I'm living it too sometimes, but I think we really need to try. Um, and lastly, I'm almost done. Thank you for entertaining all my comments. Um, mental health supports. So I'm really proud of what we were able to put together in the way of mental health supports, but I'm worried that folks don't know about them. And so I'm wondering if we could do more outreach somehow, some way, I don't have a, a real answer for what that looks like, but I think people need to know or be reminded of the tools that we do have and also want to suggest, um, and again, I don't know how this really plays out. Maybe we could point um, folks to some of our partners, but what can our kids do? What are creative ways to maintain mental wellness? Not just reach out when you're really suffering and having a challenge, but what can you do to keep your spirits up in these really, really hard times? What are creative ways to continue to be social? and maybe be more proactive with um, the outward facing messaging on how to do that um, may be beneficial. So ultimately, I mean, I guess I'll close with, um, I am very committed to following science and the experts and the doctors. I am none of those things and I don't try to be. And so we need to stay in line with them. And right now they're saying K through six could go to school. So um, I urge, urge the agreements to, our conversations to start happening. So hopefully we can change the agreements. And Ms. Yeah. Uh -huh. we do have an item coming to the board as well in a month on our kind of social emotional wellness, but I, we'll, we'll take the comments about making sure we're communicating <clears throat> even in between time. And one of the other things I think we, we will commit to is we won't necessarily have an agendized item every time, but if we know we're going to have a staff report on this, we're going to try and put that in there. I think sometimes what the, the public doesn't realize is like, I met with Ms. Fiasquez today about the agenda already for two weeks from now, partially because we have a holiday coming up each week. Um, 
but our timelines on our agendas are pretty tight. And, and sometimes we, based on if something happens or not, we don't always decide we're going to have um, an update until, like I think there have been times where the governor's made a big announcement on the Friday and then we're like, okay, well, we need to make sure we address that. But we are going to attempt to make sure that we post when we are going to have that um, in that staff report, whether it would be about this or anything else. So the community is aware of the topics that we wanna cover even in staff reports. I think that's a great idea um, because sometimes items just aren't clear what's gonna be covered. Um, and I, I'd i say I'm in agreement that I don't know that we should commit to an item every agenda, um, but I do think we need to commit to the ongoing conversation in a way that um, is meaningful and impactful and people are really engaged and are able to share their thoughts and ideas and able to get our thoughts without violating Brown Act. You know, we were successful in doing our community chats with two of us. Um, I know we didn't get the turnouts that we were hoping for, but maybe it'll be different this time. Um, so just a thought. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Creason. Dr. McKibben. Uh, my question uh, is around uh, the whole, uh, when we were talking about uh, coming back to school before, we were talking about phase in, uh, for example, and to try to, will we all be pretty much coming back the same way? Or do you do you anticipate the possibility that, that we might be coming back K2, or we might be coming back uh, 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 in, in different kinds of formats? Well, right now our agreement would be that everybody would return at the same time. Um, so if we were to do something different, we would have to have another agreement on that. And uh, conformity would also be that uh, one's, uh, from one school to another, it would pretty much look the same also? Or do you think there would be some uh, allowable uh, flexibility. I, I think you have to have uniformity. Otherwise we could end up with, I, I mean, I was having a conversation with a parent today and they, they, it was around, you know, well, why couldn't some classes be back five days a week? And I said, and she thought that maybe there would be space just based on how many kids would come back. And I said, well, how would that work if, if there were two second grade classes and one of them was and your child was in the other class and it wasn't that that kind that would create more animosity and really really anger so we have to have uniformity as we bring folks back uh in terms of vaccines i was talking uh last week with uh other uh, uh school board uh members from around the county and one of the things that they were mentioning was that they were uh, doing some flexibility related to who was getting vac vaccinated because there were some reactions that were happening. And if you had all the third grade teachers vaccinated at the same time, uh, that, uh, and, and also there will be a push for guest teachers uh, around certain things. So is there any chance that, uh, that uh, that the vaccines might be phased in so that all the, all the teachers in one grade, for example, uh, wouldn't be vaccinated at the same time? I, I think that would really be unlikely. And really the reason being the amount of, uh, we're having a hard enough time in this county coordinating the right people, educators, for example, to get vaccinated. Um, you're seeing people that are getting vaccinated who are actually aren't in those tiers. Uh, our priority is gonna be once we able to once we're able to have the vaccine, um, we are talking about if, if we're able to have some involvement in this, um, identifying starting with, in fact, Trent was on a call with Dignity Health today around schools and looking at the ages of employees. So prioritizing some of those, mm -hmm. yeah. prioritizing our special ed centers where we have, uh, you know, I think it was 60 some teachers and 108 classified employees we would wanna prioritize those because they're already there. And then at that point, really the prioritization would be around getting all of those folks at work at schools. I, the, the, we really wanna get all educators vaccinated as soon as we can. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. McKibben. And I have um, some just additional comments, less on the questions and what I do wanna, um, I think the first part is on kind of this fidelity to the state guidance. And um, I know it's moved around quite a bit. 
but again, as was kind of clarified earlier, particularly with the questions from Ms. Creason, right? Our agreement predated the existing um, guidance. And, and that being said, I think the main distinction there is this five-day requirement in red versus the two weeks. And so if we're sticking to the guidance, I think we should stick to the guidance. And I, from my perspective, like every week is worth fighting for and red is red. So if there was place, um, if there's any place for movement, that's where it's in that kind of two weeks versus five day period um, that um, is the most compelling piece to me, particularly. I mean, we're coming up kind of on that anniversary of when we closed our doors and I never in my wildest um, imagination thought that um, almost a year later we would still be here. So for me, every day, every week is worth fighting for. Red is red and that two weeks isn't there anymore. Um, so just wanna highlight that and also speak a little bit more to um, how the numbers get a little bit um, differentiated. It's not different data, they're just calculated differently. So what the state, how the state calculates its tiers, there's a 19 day lag built there, right? So it's a 19 day average for each county, which is how you end up with this slightly higher number than what the county has, which reports out a seven day lag in their dashboard. And so that explains the discrepancies in the numbers, but kind of, the green or red light is based on the blue tier guidance. And so it's pretty frustrating, right? To have those different numbers out there, but also recognize that um, I get really excited when I see the progress we're making here in Sacramento County. And um, I hope the numbers continue to trend that way uh, for the time being, you know, the way things currently work, we're reliant upon what gets printed in the blue tier in the blueprint and how CDPH calculates their numbers. So that's the distinguishing piece. I will say what also is in the guidance, right, is an emphasis on the purple tier and continue, the continuation of offering um, targeted in-person services in person. And as was reported at the outset of Superintendent Kern's report, we continue to take advantage of that. I know I see more and more buses going around throughout the day and it really brights, brightens up my day every time I, I see one because it just means that we are adding just a little bit more students to the classroom and we're trending in the right direction not in the opposite direction. Um, the topic of vaccines I just want to express and chime in on the frustration and um, so our community knows you know as has already been stated our commitment is for red nothing has changed in that. However, I feel a pretty firm commitment to come back in red in the safest environment possible. And so it's pretty frustrating to see our neighboring counties prioritizing education and childcare staff. Um, at the outset, yes, there was a little bit of confusion from the state, which kind of has been a pattern throughout this event. But as early as early last week, the state clarified that it's 65 and up and these priority workforce tiers. So I know it's super disheartening to see our neighboring counties, El Dorado, Placer, Nevada, prioritizing education and childcare workers um, and not Sacramento County. It's super frustrating to that. And um, I wanna thank my colleagues for signing on to a letter that went to our county officials. Um, in addition to my colleagues, um, we had our neighboring partner um, school board members from throughout the region, 11 in total, basically saying, hey, the state can, says we can prioritize them. Why aren't we prioritizing them? I completely want to distinguish it between, you know, from a um, supply argument, right? Because there's no doubt, like there's still um, a supply side issue for sure. We don't have enough on, you know, today to be vaccinating everybody, but the potential and the um, possibility of lining up and making it available to our education and childcare workers is a really huge and important distinction. Um, so hope to have a response on at some point, or at least know kind of what the plan is here in Sacramento County, because I know it's been something we've been working for for a while, but there still doesn't seem to be um, any plans and it's not a it's not a supply or um, a piece that we can control. They, the, you know, the feds didn't mail us a bunch of vaccines. So just know 
So we're not withholding it from anybody. We're doing everything possible to continue to fight to again, um, make sure that when we return, it's in the safest possible conditions. And then also just want to flag, particularly on this question of kind of who's open, who's not, who's doing what. I believe um, later this week, the State Board of Education is releasing a um, opening status type dashboard that will indicate and um, corroborate what Superintendent Kern said earlier, which is that um, every other district in Sacramento County is in distance learning. Um, yes, there are some cohorts and in-person um, kind of caveats to that that we're also using, but the uh, instructional model is distance learning throughout the county. Um, so know that we continue to, to fight Superintendent Kern. I appreciate the update. Um, we are working hard and fighting for every week and every day that we can um, take advantage of the appropriate conditions. Thankfully in the community, things are improving. I just am, implore the community members that are listening in to continue to distance and wash your hands and wear masks. I have never been so terrified of a sporting event like the Super Bowl. I hope that doesn't result in an increase, but we'll continue to monitor things. Um, but know that, uh, again, conversations and the work continues in earnest. And as was iterated, and I'll speak on my behalf, I'm not entertaining a distance learning fall scenario right now, like at all. That's not in my head. That's me speaking on behalf of myself. But know that I know that there was some media from national outlets about that, but know that that's not the conversation. So um, with that, um, I think unless there's any additional remarks from my colleagues or Superintendent Kern, we will continue on um, with our, our agenda items, including I'll note um, visitor comment shortly, but um, one quick round for any additional comments. Okay. Um, I also just um, I wanna say thank you for the, the robust report and the robust discussion from my colleagues. Um, we are now at item C3 through C5. Mr. Allen, do we have any reports from board appointed district committees, employee organizations or other district organizations? We have not had any requests to speak on item C3 through C5. Okay, well with that then we are at item D, visitor comment. Will you please give instructions to those in attendance via Zoom on how they can raise their hand if they have a comment at this time? Certainly President Viasquez. Uh, this item is an opportunity for those individuals attending the meeting to offer comment on topics that are not on tonight's agenda. If your comment is related to an item on tonight's agenda, we would ask that you hold your comment until that item is called and public comment will be offered at that time. If you'd like to offer a comment on a topic that is not on tonight's agenda and have joined us on the Zoom environment, now would be your time to raise your hand. To do so, click the raise hand button found at the bottom of your screen on a mobile device or a desktop Zoom client, or by pressing star nine if you've dialed into the meeting tonight. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Allen. Do we have any general visitor comments? I do show seven hands raised at this time. Okay, I would like to remind the public that comments are limited to two minutes. The clock on the screen that uh, Mr. Allen will share momentarily will count down the time. Under the Ralph M. Brown Act, the board is not allowed to comment on items that are not on the agenda, so we're not ignoring your comments. We just can't respond to any individual comments. The superintendent can refer items to staff who can follow up with you. And before we get started, I'll just remind the public and my colleagues that by default, uh, this particular agenda item um, is set at, uh, is kind of preset at 30 minutes. We'll get through the first round of comments. And then if we get to that threshold, we'll re revisit um, next, next steps. Mr. Allen, take it away. Thank you, President Viasquez. Our first comment will be from Ms. Alicia Nichols. Ms. Nichols, when you are ready. Good evening. My name is Alicia Nichols and I am an IA3 at San Juan High School and a voting member of the school district. I am here this evening to educate you on the inequities of classified and certificated employees and how this impacts the, uh, our community and the growth of our students. When I was first hired at an IA in 2019, I wasn't entirely sure why there was a shortage. I started as an IA too, one-on-one. -on -one. My student was an amazing young woman and 
I am so proud to have been able to help educate her. However, I was not trained for this position. I wasn't given a set break with the required coverage needed by law to watch her. And I was only paid $13 an hour, which was less than I had been making as the cashier at Best Buy and much less than a state funded caregiver who does the same things. But I stayed because I love this job. I love the students and I love helping them understand the curriculum in ways that I know they'll enjoy despite the fact that I rarely got to take the breaks that I deserved by law. On my campus, there are only five IAs that have to help over 120 students with IEPs every day. Not only have our jobs become more difficult with distance learning, but the sheer amount of work multitasking and the straight up teaching that we do uh, in class are also worth mentioning. Some of my teachers just call me their co-teacher to their students or subs because it makes it easier to understand my role that way. So is it really fair for us to make a fraction of what teachers make for the same amount of work? Even my freshman can answer that question for you. So I will ask again, where's the consideration for our stipend for setting up our home offices. There needs to be more communication between the district, our union, admins, and instructional assistants. The fact that IA still have not been notified of their hours for this school year, no discussions at the district level about hazard pay for classified employees if we go back before the pandemic ends and or we're vaccinated, and that I could apply for welfare while being educating the future of our country is just sad. By the way, uh, you pay me 3000 too much for EITC, but thanks for the notice in the mail. How does this affect our students? Well, how are we supposed to do our jobs from home when we're not paid enough to meet the medium rent for Sacramento County? How am I supposed to educate my students on a next summit? I would like you to conclude your comments at this time, please. I urge you as a board to address the extreme income inequity between the classified and certificated employees. Thank you, Ms. Nichols. And our next comment will be from Anderson Reich, when you are ready. And it will take one moment as we do need to promote this user to a panelist to be able to offer comment. Anderson, you should have the ability to unmute now if you would like to offer your comment. Hello, Hello. sorry about that. that. I was, I was uh, on. Uh, on another book club. No problem, go ahead. And we will move on then to uh, Marina Gable. Marina, uh, when you are ready. Ready? ready? Open, Open schools now! Open schools now! Open schools now! Open Open schools now! 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 Open further comment. We will move on to Mr. Ben Avey. Mr. Avey, when you are ready. Thank, Thank you, you. President Biasca, yeah, yeah. Uh, board, board member, member, Lieutenant Kern. Um, I just I want to start by saying thank you for having me for this new agenda. I have uh, 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 spoke with many of you this week yeah. asked. And, and I think, I think it, should it should be on every It should be on every because there is this I'm really sorry to interrupt, but I cannot hear with the echo, and I don't know if that's on our side or his. I'm hearing on your side as well. 
and it, it seems to be following the follower. follower. So, so I'm wondering. I'm wondering. I'm wondering. Is anybody else having uh, trouble hearing other than Ms. Creason? Ms. Creason, let me try muting the mic on my side just in case it's picking up uh, the audio and feeding it back as well. And, and I'm having trouble too. I'm having trouble too. I will note you guys are echoing when you talk even when I'm on mute. Okay. Oh. I think he fixed it. That sounded he I saw he sounded clear just then. Agreed. Mr. Avey, if you would like to resume. Thank Can you. we maybe give him his full two minutes back? I because I we didn't I didn't hear any of the first part. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Creason. So as I was saying, thank you very much for adding uh, COVID as an agenda item. I know I communicated with many of you uh, this week about that. And quite honestly, um, I did that because I have never seen the level of, of what I'm seeing in the community right now. Parents are breaking, students are breaking. Many of them have already broken. And right now, you're not having conversations about the students. If it was about the students right now, we'd be talking about reopening tonight. It's allowed tonight. If it was an agenda item, you could discuss it tonight, but we're not. Now we have to push it off for two weeks. And when we do talk about it, we're gonna be not talking about students. We're gonna be talking about the unions and what's good for them. And what's good for the union is not always what's good for the student. The Center for, the Disease, the Center for Disease Control has told us that we should return to in-person learning. The county public health officer has told us to return to in-person learning. The state has said it's safe for a lot of students to return to in-person learning. Let's have that conversation, not talk about what unions are willing to do. Make them do what's right for students. Make them come in and do what is right for the students that they care about. Right now, to be honest, I think why so many parents are frustrated is because if push comes to shove, they think that you are going to choose what's good for the union and not what's good for their students. And that's not always, you know, it's not easy always to separate those two things, but right now it is. There is what's good for the students and what's good for the students isn't always what the union wants. I hope you understand that. I hope we can continue this conversation at every board meeting going forward. It's essential for our parents. We cannot leave our kids behind. Do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Avey, for your comment. Our next comment will be from Lance Christensen. When you are ready, Mr. Christensen. Superintendent Kern, board members, thanks for your time. My name is Lance Christensen, and a few weeks ago, I had a pretty incredible experience. It was about the time the governor had did a, uh, had a, a political about face on lockdown, even as COVID cases and deaths were rising. It was fairly innocuous. It was the announcement that the district could not find a way to administer the PSAT to our junior class a test that's second only to the SAT and possible impacts in college options. Despite a private high school residing in our district that found a way to make it happen, it was at that moment that validated my belief that our kids were going to suffer the trial of being categorically ignored through May. I've been opposed to keeping the kids out of school for anything less than the initial shock wave last spring. We were told that time and then communicated to our five kids with the zeal of a recent convert that if we would just take 15 days to slow the spread, that all life would return back to normal. The minute we hit day 16, I knew the reaction was no longer about the science, epidemiology, or slowing a virus that would not be tamed. It was about power politics. And who lost the vote? Our kids. They were robbed of some profoundly important coming of age experiences they will never regain. To put a fine point on this, if the district is still shut down at the beginning of March and you keep deflecting responsibility for the closures is on county and state health officials who keep moving the goalposts and continue to capitulate to rapacious teachers union demands despite the overwhelming data against their position that it doesn't look like you'll be reopening classrooms this year and I fear this fall. 
And there's only one conclusion I can come to is that the district has given up on my kids. Tonight's update was as clear as mud. And I don't know exactly what I should tell my kids. I hope that you can figure out a way to open the doors and get these kids back in their seats. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Christensen. Our next comment will be from Steve Centerwall. When you are ready. Hello, Hello everyone. everyone. Thanks, Thanks Thank for you. Um, listening to my comment. Um, I uh, First of all, I wanna thank um, Superintendent Kern and Ms. Creason for responding to some of the emails that I had sent to them. I really appreciate, appreciate them taking the time to um, answer some of my questions. I wanted to echo the frustration and frankly, the anger that I'm hearing from many, many parents in the district about what I think is really a passive approach to trying to get our kids back to school and really advocating for our kids. Now we know that the uh, teachers union will advocate uh, and represent the teachers. I think what we're feeling is frustration that we don't have, feel like we have anybody at the decision table that is advocating for our kids. I want to ask you uh, specifically to reopen your agreement and negotiations with uh, the teachers union and for the board members and the staff of the district to be our advocates, to advocate, advocate for our kids to get back in school. And not only at, that, at, at the, the um, school level and the county level, but also at the state level, you should be telling our state leaders that you wanna get back to school and showing them the plan you have in place, specific plan for each school on how are you going to do that. What I hear is a lot of deflecting about who is telling you what you can and cannot do. And I hear a lot of uh, innuendo about an agreement that you don't think you can break with the teachers union. So I just wanna uh, reemphasize everybody's frustrated. Very, everybody's very angry about all of this. And uh, we need you to be more active, less passive in your leadership of the district. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Central Wall. Our next comment will be Garrett McDermott, when you are ready. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Garrett McDermott. I'm the parent of uh, three kids at Early Elementary. I'm currently out here at the district office with uh, a bunch of the parents that you'd heard earlier and uh, a lot of yelling and shouting. So uh, thank you to all of them. Also, a big thank you to Ms. Uh, 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 Zima Creason for speaking to me and other parents answering our questions. That was amazing. Um, I just want to let everybody know that, uh, you know, I served in the military for nine years. I did multiple combat deployments. I know that being a leader is tough, especially in tough times. It seems that there's a lot of finger pointing going on as to why we have or not or cannot reopen our schools to in-person learning that needs to stop. As leaders of our school district, the leader of the teachers union and all of our elected officials who are making policy regarding reopening, I ask you all to start doing what is best for our kids. They are suffering at home. They need to be back in school now for more than five hours per week. Yes, there might be risks, but with the guidance from health officials and the examples from other school districts who have already reopened to in-person learning, those risks will be minimal. I wanna ask all the teachers out there, why did you sign up to be a teacher? I'm pretty sure it wasn't for the money. I'm pretty sure you did it for the children. And I'm pretty sure you all know that getting them back in class is the best thing for them. Your union is doing its job and trying to protect you. No one can fault them for that. No one could have fathomed that we would be in the situation we are in now. I get it, you didn't sign up to put yourself at risk. And that is not what we are asking you to do. I'm asking that you will do what you think is best for the interest of our children. Let your union reps know that you are ready for in-person learning. And if they don't listen, you can make your voice heard by withdrawing from the union. Something needs to happen now, especially in light of this new information that was released today about being in the purple tier with 25 cases under 100,000 that we can reopen now. I don't know why that hasn't been addressed uh, in the negotiations and hope the negotiations go quickly. Our kids need to get back to school. Thank you very much for your time. And thank you for your comment, Mr. McDermott. Our next comment will be from Tracy F. Tracy F, when you are ready. Thank you, board. 
I'm using my two minutes to share data I have collected and ask the board to consider them when making decisions to protect our kids. Since schools have been closed, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children has recorded a 90% increase. The monthly average of reports taken of children being harmed and or kids missing increased from 1 million to 4 million in one month. Internet crimes against children have doubled and tripled in certain months. Human trafficking departments are reporting an increase in sex trafficking in young girls. Gang units are recording a doubled number in homicides, kids dying, gun violence, crimes, and incarceration. Children hospitals are reporting that suicidal ideation, depression, and child abuse is skyrocketing. Antidepressant drug prescriptions for children have jumped from one to two prescriptions a month to one to two a day. These statistics do not lie and I am available to share my sources if requested. They tell us that another pandemic is brewing. Adverse childhood experiences last a lifetime. Right now, our district is part of a group of districts up and down this state that are part of the problem and are responsible for some of these statistics. It is the district's job to do no harm. In January 2021, CDC and JAMA reported transmissions from schools and school-based activities are 37% lower than those from other transmissions of this virus. I hear talk about educational equity, but the kids that don't have parents that can sit with them that have to work and the kids as parents that can't afford tutors are being lost. We cannot be talking about educational equity when we are not paying attention to the data and the kids. They are telling us what they need. I beg of you board, please stay firm with the TA so all K through 12 students can be back on campus as soon as the two week clearance has been met. The district has shown us they are ready the livelihoods of generations rely on it. And frankly, so does the reputation of this district. Thank you. And thank you for your comment. Our next comment will be from user Warda Ali, when you are ready. Hi, Hi. can you hear me? We can. Okay, sorry, there's a bit of an echo. I hope that doesn't um, disrupt anything. So, um, hello, uh, my name is Warda Ali and I am a TA Youth Mental Health Advocate and I'm a part of the Muslim Mental Health TA Advocacy Team in Sacramento. I'm also a recent graduate from Choices Charter School. Um, I just wanted to firstly thank you um, for all that you're doing. Um, I want to thank the board and superintendent, um, Kent Kern, um, for all you're doing for the students in the San Juan District and all your hard work. Um, I want to contribute first off and help support the San Juan students by sharing resources for um, mental health resources and making sure that the um, importance of mental health is not forgotten during distance learning. Um, I want to emphasize the importance of mental health during this time as students, teachers, and faculty and staff are all overwhelmed and stressed. Um, I also want to make sure that communities and all communities and groups are heard when it comes to mental health struggles and general needs of youth in our area. Um, I, as a senior and a recent graduate, um, know firsthand how students are struggling and I know there's only so much we can do um, as the pandemic is not in our control or in our hands. Um, but I look forward to hearing what the board is um, working towards and what they're willing to work um, on when it comes to mental health advocacy and um, making sure that students are feeling heard and um, well taken care of in a sense um, when it comes to their mental health struggles and just making sure that students have a place to go to when in, when in need and um, when needing to, um, I guess, get some help. Um, my colleague, uh, my one of my um, peers on my youth advocacy team, Christina, and I would be more than happy to help stay in contact with you guys and work with you guys on any mental health projects or um, if you guys need resources to share with students and um, schools around our district, I'd be more than happy to help and work towards that. Um, thank you so much again, and um, I appreciate your time. And thank you for your comment. Our next comment is from Christina Aguilar when you are ready. Hi, can everyone hear me okay? We can. Yes, we can. I believe Mr. Allen's trying to avoid the echo, um, but yes, we can hear you. Perfect, thank you. Um, so my name is Christina Aguilar. Um, I also represent Mass SSF, the Muslim American Society and Social Services Foundation and our Muslim Tay Advocacy Program as Warda had mentioned. Um, I just wanna thank all of you for your work and effort. I know these are really uncertain times and none of this comes easy. Um, you know, there's, there's no plan for a, a global pandemic. Um, 
and although schools, you know, have, closing has been a struggle, we can't disregard that the pandemic is still present and we want to ensure the safety of everyone involved. Um, while saying this, it's of course important to note that there are limited resources at home. Of course there are, um, it, and it's definitely a challenge for everyone involved. Um, and as students continue to have limited resources through home study, I just want to call a friendly reminder again for the importance of mental health for staff and students, um, especially for our refugee youth within the district. Um, I know you've been working hard to support our students who belong to a very diverse community and refugee youth often face many barriers when it comes to mental health and wellness resources. Again, we'd be more than willing to support the district with resources and be able to reach these students to make sure that every student is supported during this time. Again, thank you so much for your continued support and efforts just to make sure that the San Juan district remains an important resource for mental health services for all students. Thank you for your time. And thank you for the comment. Our next comment is from L.A. Davis. And when you are ready. User L.A. Davis, you should have the ability to unmute and offer your comment at this time if you would like. And it looks like we may be having some technical difficulty. So we will come back and try you again, L.A. Davis. And for now, we will move on to uh, user Ashley Ford. When you are ready. Hi, I'd like to um, read the definition of a leader. A leader is someone who can see how things can be improved and who rallies people to move towards that better vision. I want every one of you to look at yourselves in the mirror tonight and ask if you have rallied, you know, and decided that you were going to be a leader when you took this position. Be a leader for our children. My son this week told me that he thought he had clinical depression. He is nine years old. How would he even know what that is? He wants to be back in school. He's dyslexic and cannot learn the way that you guys have a distance learning set up. These kids need to be back in school. We are coming up on a year, a year, folks. Every district around us has rallied for their students. You guys have not. I have four students in the district and I will pull every single one of them. If it is my last dime that I have to pay to put them in a private school or somewhere else, we will move, break up our family, all because you guys won't rally for our children. This is ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. If private schools can be open, if gyms can be open, if stores can be open, if the districts around us can be open, we need to be open. Our teachers knew what they were gonna get paid and they took their jobs. They should not put their politics in our children's education and one and the same. Speak up for our district or we will do everything we can to recall every one of you. Remember, we the people voted you in and we can remove you. Do your jobs, fight for our students. And thank you for your comment. Our next will be from John Stockett, when you are ready. Trent, I have a few kids that will speak, so um, I don't know if you do for each of them. Uh, how, how many do you have there? I have five kids. They're not, the comments why don't we go ahead and start and I will try and reset timers between uh, speakers. Okay. Go ahead, you're first. Go ahead. My name is Truman Socket. I am six. I kind of kind of am disappointed that I have to go to Zooms. Zooms. I kind of 
miss my teacher. I miss playing at school. It is hard to listen learn, learn because I couldn't see what he is drawing, drawing because computers computer shut off to today. Today my zooms went off. Can I go back to school? Okay, hey, that one's done. <laughs> Here's the next one. My name is Spencer Stockett. I am nine years old and I am a third grader at Pershing Elementary School. Distance learning is hard for me because a lot of things we're supposed to do in the classroom I can't do in distance learning. One thing I miss is playing sports with my friends. One sport I really miss is playing soccer because it's my favorite sport. I have also been practicing a lot of tricks with, tricks with my soccer ball. There are more games I miss like dog ball, kickball, baseball, four square, and so much more. Another thing I miss is not seeing my friends at school. And I really miss playing with them. I also miss my teachers and seeing them at school. And I miss my teachers teaching me at school. Another thing I miss is not playing games from PE, art, and music. One game I really miss from P is from PE, and it's called Free Stance, where you dance to music, and if the teachers catch you, you're on their team. The last one, Standing Wins. The last thing I miss is watching a movie about a book reading. My class reads a long book, and we read a chapter every day. When we finally finish the book, we watch a movie about the book. Thank you. Okay, next one. I'm Abigail Stockett. I'm 13 years old and I'm a seventh grader at Andrew Carnegie Middle School. Distance learning has affected me because I can't go to school, play sports, or hang out with my friends. It's hard for me to not play sports because I'm a sports person. I play track, volleyball, and soccer. Without sports, I have nothing to look forward to at the end of the day. I don't get to see my team and I don't get to have fun with them. It's hard for me to do school at home and at, not in school because it's hard to keep my focus on schoolwork for several hours. I get good grades, but I know I can do better just by being in actual school and having the teachers always be there to help out if I'm ever struggling. It's hard for me not being able to see my friends because normally I see them every day at school. Not seeing my friends means not being able to have someone to talk to when I need it. Thank you. Okay, next one. My name is Logan Stockett. I am 15 years old and I go to Bella Vista High School. Although I can say Zoom ha had and has its benefits, I think everyone would prefer to be at school where they can learn much better, get easier help and grow their knowledge. All in all, in, in school learning can, can and will always be better than at home learning. Thank you. Okay, another one and then my husband and I after that. Uh, my name is Caden Stockett. I'm 17 years old and a senior at Bella Vista High School. Distance learning has been difficult for me because I am a hands-on learner. As much as I love my family, all four of my younger siblings are at home, and that makes it incredibly difficult to concentrate. Internet issues always arise at the most inconvenient of times. Lastly, my fellow students and peers interact less with the teacher and the students. We need to put us back in school because we all know we can do it safely. Thank you. Hey, now my comments and then my husband. Thank you for listening to all my kids. I, obviously we have five. My kids spend five to seven hours a day on the computer. It's not healthy for kids to learn this way. I feel like the consequences of sitting in front of the computer this long are never brought up in any discussions. When kids, including my own, are on the computers for long hours, they're exposed to, but not limited to, sexual comment, cyber bullies and predators, failing grades in school, reading fewer books, less socialization, not enough physical activity and mood problems. We have heard from the California pediatric offices across the state to open. Everywhere I turn due to the increase in all the mental illness bombarding the children, schools need to open. Our own CDC says the data shows that as long as schools practice careful social distancing, strict mask wearing practices and sanitized surfaces whenever possible, Schools can maintain safe spaces for students to socialize while staying healthy. 
I understand that we cannot open while we're in the purple tier. However, we could have gone back and you guys decided not to in the fall. Now, when asked if we could return to in-person learning with state guidelines with 25 out of 100,000 positivity rate, I am told that this is probably too hard. It is worth fighting for our kids to be in in-person learning. I've been told at numerous meetings over the last year, we are ready, we are prepared. We are the most prepared district in the area with all our PP purchases, deep cleaning, HVAC upgrades, et cetera, but yet we chose not to open. I am a stay-at-home mom and a certified teacher, but even, even with this, um, we are battling mental illness. Kids who hate school, hurting themselves when they don't understand, and screaming with programs don't work. Sorry, my husband will finish. COVID is real. At what point is mental illness just as real or more? This too cannot be ignored. I can see a neighboring school board in Sac County fight to open up as soon as they can for secondary grades. Five days in the red tier, not two weeks. Will you fight for this? Again, you chose not to open. Our kids have not been at school for nearly a full year. The teachers have a union that fights for their rights. You, the board, were chosen to fight for our kids' education. Even if you say it is a difficult or heavy lift, our kids are starving for real education. It is past time for you to do the right thing. Thank you. We're done. Thank you. And thank you all for your comments. Uh, President Viasquez, I do believe that puts us at roughly 15 speakers and we have a 30 minute limit. Uh, what, would be, what would be the pleasure to hear? Mr. Allen, it was a little bit hard to hear you there at the end, but I think you're noting that we've reached our 30 minute mark at which point. Um, and we still have. Can, can individual, can folks hear me? Yeah. Okay, so we still have some raised hands. So if there's um, if there's no objection, and I'll just note that right now I can only see the two minute time clock. I can't see my colleagues reactions. So I would ask you to indicate um, verbally in some way. We still have some raised hands. We've reached our 30 minute mark. Um, I am inclined to continue to hear folks out and continue with our, um, participants who've joined us via Zoom with their raised hands, um, unless there's objections or a preferred course. And I just want to remind everybody, both in attendance and my colleagues, that there is another opportunity for public comment as well at item J, um, but want to, of course, respect um, people's time and, you know, they joined us now. And so um, if is it the um, will of the board to continue on with the individuals who have raised their hands at this point? Yes. yes. I say we listen to the five that have their hands raised. Okay, so with that, seeing no objection, we will continue through with the folks who have their hands raised and then the remainder of public comment, I would ask come at the second opportunity, item J. Um, so, Mr. Allen, if you don't mind continuing to facilitate through our last five raised hands. Trent, you're on mute. Absolutely, President Viasquez. Thank you. And with that, we will resume public comment with uh, Zach Erickson, when you are ready. All right, good evening. Uh, yeah, my name is Zach Erickson. Uh, uh, tonight, I heard a lot of excuses and grasping onto guidelines uh, in an effort to not think for yourselves. You're actually really good at selling hope to all, all of us parents, um, but unfortunately, you've spent all, uh, all your goodwill. And tonight, I wanted to talk about history. As we teach our children lessons learned from those that came before us, we tell them about people and groups on both sides of various events, turning points, systemic changes, paradigm shifts. As we teach those lessons, we often villainize those on the wrong side of history. 
This is often completely justified and used to teach our children right from wrong, teach about progress, and inspire them to be on a path that will keep them on the right side of history throughout their lives. Let me be clear. You are on the wrong side of history. Time will tell a story of the damage that you've done to an entire generation of our society. You will be included in future lessons of those that failed our children, those that didn't do what was necessary to educate, those that found obstacles over solutions and overcomplicated the process of reopening schools. We can't achieve if we don't try. Your actions are causing direct harm to the next generation of our community. History will judge and it will tell a cautionary tale to our children who not to become. One last thought on history. Unions were organized to counteract power imbalance. Now it's our children who are the most vulnerable that are not being heard. It seems as if the teacher unions have gained enough power to become the very thing unions were created to protect against. As we've seen from our past, the pendulum often swings back. This is a reminder that your community in which you serve is not complacent. Please do the right thing. Thank you. And thank you for your comment. Our next comment will be from Michael Sayers when you are ready. Thank you for the time. I would like to support all the parents that have come before and express their frustration with both the school board and the teachers union to express their experiences with mental health because many of us have been suffering the same uh, situations at home and sometimes you feel very isolated. So I appreciate you stepping forward and sharing your experiences. If you're a teacher and you're on this meeting and you're listening, you are culpable. You are failing your children, these children and our children. You should be ashamed of yourself and you will pay a price down the road. If you are part of the board or part of the school, uh, the school board, the superintendent, or anybody at the executive office of the San Juan Unified School District, and you're not making these schools open in a timely manner, you should be ashamed and you are culpable and you will pay the price down the road. My mother was a teacher in this union for nearly 50 years. She has five grandchildren, none of which are in school and she is ashamed of you. That should tell you all you need to know. I appreciate the time. Everybody stay safe, and I hope to see all of us back in school soon. Thank you. And thank you for your comment. Our next comment will be from Sabrina Bernardo, when you are ready. Hello, sorry about that, I think I was on mute. Um, I do have a son, he's in fourth grade, he goes to Pershing Elementary. Love our school, love our principal, we love his teacher. Um, but I do wanna just state and be in support of opening schools as soon as possible. Um, I definitely agree with Ms. Creason's earlier board comment as she stated um, really exactly what I wanted to touch on. Um, the board members and the teachers unions, as parents, we are not experts. We should be following the guidelines of CDC, the state and the county. New research has come out and continues to come out saying that the spread of COVID from children and within schools is minimal. I think that's very apparent now. Um, we don't get to pick and choose what we're going to follow. So with this new information, I expect you all to heed the recommendations and guidelines as swiftly as you did when they advised closures. There should be no excuse as to why these kids are not back in school immediately after giving the green light, which ironically was today. We should not be waiting until the next board meeting to have this decision made and get this stuff done. There should be a special board meeting called. I'm pretty sure that is something that can happen. So please, please, please look into calling a special board meeting as soon as possible. Even if that means just in a couple of days, why not get them back as soon as possible? The school board has already let the waiver opportunity slip through your fingers. So again, please don't let another day go by when these kids should and could be back in school. Also, finally, I would like to ask that you quickly revisit the hybrid option that was selected and um, make a recommendation to move that back to the four-day option that most parents and teachers 
unit actually selected and asked for in the first place, there was a majority that actually wanted the four day option. So we need to make up the time that's been lost and really get these kids back to the fullest extent possible as soon as possible. Thank you for your time. And thank you for your comment. Our next comment is from DDA Kevin Jones, when you are ready. Good evening. Um, I was taken aback by the comment earlier about the growing divide between teachers and parents. And I think unfortunately that divide is a real thing. And it appears no doubt in large part based upon some frustration and less than full information. Uh, the board has quite frankly, not communicated in any professional way and it has caused infighting amongst two groups that should be together in our care for our kids. Um, two teachers, please speak up when you can. Parents can't hear you, we can't see you. Parents don't know what you want versus what the union wants. 75% of teachers voted to return to school four days a week last year. That number's gotta be higher now. But the union didn't agree to a return. And to listen to the union now, nothing has changed. And to listen to the board tonight, nothing can change under the current agreement. And it must be a scary prospect of renegotiating based upon current information because nobody sounded confident about exercising that option. Board member Creason was the only one tonight to address real community concerns. And I appreciate that, thank you. By asking clarifying questions based on emails and calls she received, she did that. The rest of you also received emails and calls, yet the rest of you punted. Plain and simple tonight, you did not advance the concerns of any of the parent uh, uh, people that are listening tonight. The stance of both the board and the union should be saying, we need to renegotiate based on updated and current information, not that we are stuck with an agreement that was made when the unknown was greater than the known. If you need a reason to renegotiate, send out a new survey. You know for a fact that two half day return hybrid model in person learning will not be the choice of teachers or parents, and certainly not the kids. Send a new survey, force the board and the union to figure this out. Pick a side, let public judge you for it. Do it for the children. And thank you for your comment. And our final comment for this public comment period will be from Carrie Hutchings, when you are ready. Um, I'm actually going to pass it over to my daughter. She's the one who wants to speak. Um, hi, I'm Leah, and I'm in seventh grade, and I'm 12 years old, and I have general anxiety disorder. And I just wanted to say that comparing to March 2020, my anxiety levels were very low, and now I can't even go into grocery stores without having a panic attack. And um, I've gotten some depression from this pandemic, and I think that we should open up because... I'm speaking for other students with mental health issues or not mental health issues. I just, it's making me very sad and depressed and other kids sad and depressed that they have to go through this and it could give kids lots of trauma. And I'm just saying that this has made my anxiety very bad and I have gotten cyber bullied um, through Zooms and I've lost friends because of this pandemic. And I just don't, it's just, it's very sad. And I just think that we should just open up. And I know that there are high risk people and high risk teachers, but this is for the kids. And I know everyone matters, but what's best for the students is to open up and what's best for their mental health is to open up. Um, but thank you for your time. That was straight from the heart, by the way, <laughs> not rehearsed, not written down, nothing. So I hope that you guys actually reconsider because a lot of this has to do now with mental health and it's insane what you guys are getting away with. Insane. And I commend, I had no idea there was a protest at the district. I probably would have been there if I had known. And I commend those parents um, and the teachers who are actually speaking up against all of this shutdown. This has been a year, this is enough. Put these kids back in school Okay, stop pussyfooting around and just put these kids back in school. You guys have the power to do this. Thank you. And thank you both for your comments. 
Uh, President Viasquez, that is the last of the five hands that were raised when the board extended the time. I would remind our guests who are with us in the meeting today that we do have another public comment period under item J. If they would like to offer a public comment on an item that is not on tonight's agenda, we would be happy to have them speak then as well. Thank you, Mr. Allen. With that, we are at item E, the consent calendar. Uh, Mr. Allen, do we have any public comments for items that are on the consent calendar? We have not received any written comment for items on the consent calendar, and I see no raised hands at this time. Okay, would anyone like to um, remove any items um, associated with E1 through E5? Uh, President Viasquez, I would like to pull item E1. Okay, staff has requested that item E1 um, related to personnel pages be pulled. Is there a motion to approve items E2 through E5? So moved. Second. Been moved by Dr. McKibben. It's been seconded by Mr. Hernandez. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 That was unanimous. So then we are at item E1 personnel pages, which was pulled from the consent calendar, Superintendent Kern. Thank you, President Viasquez. Um, on the uh, personnel pages, the first page on appointments, we need to pull item CL-500. Um, so that item needs to be pulled off and not take action on at this time. Okay. Um, is there a motion to approve item E1 as amended? So absent the CL-500 um, item. So moved. Second. Been moved by Ms. Costa and seconded by Ms. Creason. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 That was unanimous. With that, we are at item G1 learning status update. Ms. Bassanelli, please begin when you're ready. Thank you. Let me just get my. Are you able to see it? Not quite yet. We just see the gallery. At least I just see the gallery view. There we go. Okay. Can you see the, I can't see the slide deck. So hold on one second while I just restart everything. Okay. There we go. Good evening, Board President Fiasquez, Board Members, Superintendent Kern and Ms. Cunningham. Tonight, the Division of Teaching and Learning would like to provide a mid-year learning status report to the Board of Education regarding student academic progress and the actions the district has taken. Ms. Bassanelli, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but I wanted to ask, um, all I see is a, a white blank slide and I wanted to see. Um, yeah, that shouldn't. May, is it just me? Could anybody else see the slide? No, I was seeing the same thing, Ms. Viasquez. Okay. Let's try it one more time. You able to see the slide? Uh, yes. Oh, perfect. Okay, so tonight we have several speakers joining us for our presentation tonight, and so I just want to take a moment to introduce them. We have Rick Messer, who's the Assistant Superintendent of Elementary Educa or Secondary Education. We have Mr. Jim Shumake, who's the Assistant Superintendent of Middle Schools and Labor Relations. Amberly Townsend Snyder, Senior Director, Elementary Education. Susan Green, Director of Assessment, Evaluation and Planning. Jamal Hicks, Vice Principal, Thomas Edison K-8 Language Institute, and Mr. Daryl Jenkins with the 100 Black Men of Sacramento. We wanted to start by um, illustrating our work is, is anchored in continuous improvement process that focuses on elevating voice from those closest to the work, listening and learning, and collaboration. These fundamental tenets not only serve as a cornerstone of our improvement work, but also have been instrumental in navigating the effects of the pandemic. As you listen to our improvement journey over the fall, you will hear examples of how the effects of the pandemic 
evolved and adapted in depth and complexity and how our actions have shifted in response. Inside our improvement work is a discipline cycle of inquiry. It's more commonly known as a PDSA cycle, which stands for Plan, Do, Study, Act. This cycle cultivates a growth mindset and focuses on learning fast, testing fast, and improving quickly. When in the planning phase of the cycle, we plan the test, including identifying our goal and the idea we wanna test. Within this portion of the cycle, we ask ourselves these questions. What are we trying to accomplish? What questions are we asking? What changes can be made as a result of the improvement? What predictions are we making? And how will we know that a change is an improvement? What will we measure? As we shift into the due phase of the cycle, we implement the plan on a small scale, document problems or unexpected observations and collect data along the way. Within the study phase of the cycle, we analyze our results, compare them to our predictions and reflect on what we've learned. The ACT phase is where we adopt, adapt, or abandon based off what we've learned from the test, and then we plan our next steps as these cycles are iterative and they build upon each other. Tonight, the Division of Teaching and Learning is going to share with you our improvement journey, and it's going to follow this PDSA cycle. Beginning with the planning piece of the cycle of inquiry, each division, elementary, middle, and high, constructed work groups composed of site leaders who were charged with studying the data and building comprehensive support systems for students, staff, and families around the focus areas illustrated on this slide. Using quantitative and qualitative data, work groups created plans and implemented supports based on initial feedback from stakeholders. Some of the initial actions they took, also known as the do portion of the cycle, are reflected on this slide and they include actions around safety net data collection and outreach, home visits, tutoring, small groups, and one-to-one -one support. As a system within the study phase of the cycle, we monitored attendance, grades, and progress towards standards, both at the system and site level. Susan Green, Director of Assessment, Evaluation, and Planning, is going to provide a systems level overview related to this data, as well as some findings for consideration. Thanks, Melissa. As you stated, that when we started to look at the study session, the first data set as a district that we decided to look at was attendance. Attendance level is broken down into five buckets for each student. Red is extreme chronic absenteeism, orange is chronically absent, yellow at risk, green good, and blue perfect. It is important to remember when we're looking at this data that attendance this year means something slightly different than it has in past years. This year, a student does count as attended if they attended the Zoom, if they turned in an ass assignment, if they are contacted by the teacher, et cetera. When you look at this bar, this chart, the top graph, the top bar is the 2020-21 numbers, bottom bar is the 2019-20 numbers for the attendance throughout the end of the October. So for both years, we're looking at it from the beginning of um, school until the end of December, sorry. This year, we have about 4.6% more students chronically absent, which is in the red and orange category, and about 5.9% more students in the good or perfect attendance, the blue and green. Next, we wanted to drill down to see what we saw as we looked at it by school type. The left-hand side graphs are the 1920 results, high school, the top line, elementary, the bottom line, and then the right-hand side is the 2021 results. In elementary, we have about 10% more students in the good or perfect attendance level than compared to this time last year. Where all of the other school types, we have about five to 7% more students in the chronically absent in the orange and red bands compared to last year. Next, we wanted to look into grades. Before I start this data, I will say that the data that we're presenting here today is similar to what other districts from throughout the state are finding for the same time period. So first thing we're gonna do is look at high school. The left-hand results are for quarter one and the right-hand graphs are for semester one. The bars, orange is the 1920 school year for the same period and the gray is the results for the 2021 school year. What we did is for each student, we looked at the number of Fs that they received in each of the terms. So we have we broke it into zero Fs, one F, two to three Fs, or four or more Fs. For this year, we saw a 5% increase of students with zero Fs from first quarter to semester one. 
which is the gray bars at the two graphs. And we saw no change for the students who had four or more Fs. And this is similar to what we've seen in past years. So this trend of having a little bit of an improvement for quarter one to quarter two is similar. <coughs> if we look at semester one this year compared to semester one last year, which is the right side graph, we have about 9% fewer students with zero Fs at the high school level and about 7% more students with four or more Fs. In the appendix of this report, we did report this data for English learners, low-income students, students with disabilities, and foster homeless students. For high school, all groups have more students with four or more Fs than last year for semester one. English learners had the, larger, the largest increase of 21% more students with four or more Fs than in previous years for high school. For middle school students, the same graphs are presented. For this year, there's about a 5% drop for students with zero Fs from quarter one to quarter two. And again, this is similar to what we've seen in previous years. If we look at quarter two this year compared to last year, the right side graph, we have 12% more students at the middle school level with four or more Fs and 13% fewer students with zero Fs. For the groups in the appendix, the largest difference was for English language learners, which had a 24% more, and for foster or homeless had 27% more of students with four or more Fs. For elementary students and middle grade students at the K-8 sites, we only have data from trimester one as of now. The left-hand graph is the middle grades at K-8 and the right-hand side is the elementary graph. For middle grades at K-8, we have about 8% more students this year with four or more Fs than we had in previous years. And for elementary, of course, we don't use A, B, C, D, or the letter grades, we use numbers. So we're looking, we looked at the number of ones the student has on the standards-based report card. And again, we had about 7% more students with four or more ones on trimester one's report card compared to last year. The last question we tried, we examined was what kind of connection we see between attendance and grades. So for each term this year, we looked at the students attendance for that period of time and their grades to see what we could find. This graph shows high school on the top set of graphs and middle school on the bottom. The left-hand side are those students who are chronically absent. The middle is those students who are at risk. And then the right-hand side is those students with good or excellent attendance. So what did we see? When we looked at high school, chronically absent students, about 20% of them had no Fs, which was, and it had, which was a slight decline in semester one. And we had about 40% of them with four or more Fs, which was a slight increase for semester one. At-risk students, we saw about 4% fewer students with zero Fs and about 4% more students who had four or more Fs. And the picture, for our students who were, have good or excellent attendance is about the same for both terms. It was about 80% of those students have zero Fs. When we look at middle school, the picture is relatively similar to high school. And remember, these are the bottom rows of graphs. Chronically absent students in middle school, 55% of them have four or more Fs in quarter two, which about was a 15% increase from quarter one. Our at-risk students, we saw 9% fewer students in quarter two with zero Fs and 9% more students with four or more Fs. When we look at our elementary and our middle grades at K-8, again, we only have one bar because we only have one grading period that we can look at, which is trimester one. The top set of bars are for the middle grades at K-8 sites and the bottom ones are for the elementary school, elementary students. When we look at our middle grades at K-8 sites, our chronically absent students, about 50% of them have four or more Fs on the report card and 10% have zero. Our at-risk students, about 20% have zero Fs and 30% have four or more. And then our students with good or excellent attendance, about 65% have no Fs. In elementary, the results are pretty similar to that. Our chronically absent students, we have about 55% with four or more ones but we have 20% with zero ones. Our at-risk students, we have about 38% with four or more ones and about 30% with zero ones. And then again, our students with good or excellent attendance, about 68% of them have zero ones. 
So what did we find in this connection? The one group that we showed some findings that we thought were important were our students at risk for chronically absent. So remember, these are students who have been absent five to 10% of the days or periods that they've been enrolled. Between 13 to 39% of them have four or more Fs or ones, depending on which grade level we looked at. And we saw an increase in both of these groups for both middle school and high school from the first quarter to the second quarter of between four and 9%. Middle school students who are chronically absent, 56% are receiving four or more Fs. That was the highest percent. Um, for middle grades, it was 51%. And for elementary, it's, I mean, for, um, in elementary school and 40% at high school. And then the last group that came through as we looked at all of this was English learners. It really didn't matter which attendance level or which school site. We had between four and 26% more students, more English learner students with four or more Fs or ones. So in addition to studying the quantitative data, we also gathered and studied qualitative data, which included voice. The video you're about to see highlights some of the voice and lived experiences that we gathered from our students. It's a lot easier to ask for help than having to like go up in person. You can just email them easily. It, like preparing for school is a lot easier now since it's right here at my home. The organization's a lot easier, as well as like the timing. Some people work better at different times of the day. It's the teachers, they explain things. It's pretty easy. It's not complicated at all. You just have to turn on your camera and, uh, and that's it. Do your assignments. During lunch, I can just go ride my bike to Twin Lakes, mm -hmm. way back to school. It's like talking with your teachers. That's what I feel like is the like best part about online school. I was actually doing better in some of my classes because when I was in person, I was kind of like messing around. And now that I'm in like distant learning, I just like try to focus because none of my friends are in the background messing around. It's really easy for me to spend more, a little bit more time with my family. The little Wi-Fi boxes, it will like be working, and then it will just shut down, and then it will work again. For the first uh, semester, it was pretty difficult, but for the second semester, I feel more positive about it. In general, just the social aspect, just talking to people. It's something that you really don't consider to be like really special until you just don't have it. Yeah, it is most stressful. It's stressful because you have to be with everyone, and everyone is looking at you. Uh, you have to answer it to a teacher. Like the technology, because sometimes the computers don't work. And it's usually the distractions at your house that keep you from not focusing on your work. Like, it's hard to teach on Zooms for the teachers. I'm struggling with, like, keeping up with work and having motivation to pretty much do it. Oh, I don't have enough time to do all of it, and so you're just picking and choosing. And I really don't think that's exactly a good thing to pick and choose work. I think you should do all of it. So it's just been going really fast paced and I can't really stay up. Like, if you if you untrap the TJ, like you're gonna like mess up the whole class flow and stuff. I've always been more of a visual learner and the distance learning just doesn't help me at all. One, I'm transferring to a whole entire new district, so I don't know anyone. And normally like at this time I would be in like band. There's just something missing from distance learning, but you get that in in-person learning. Don't like that we can't have hands-on learning. I'm better than what I can do at school than on a computer and my grades are not showing that. I enjoy using tech, doing online school. I feel like it's more engaging for me. I would like to go back to school. Like half the time, I really don't want to go to school, but I'd rather go to school if, we, if it was in person. School, it's one of my favorite things in the whole entire world. I love going to school. I love being with my friends. School isn't really what it used to be. So to me, it feels more like a chore. I know I know everybody at Mesa wants those students to drive in. I really love that. I've been like on the GPA board all four years, and I don't want to like just throw that away. So I want to keep up my grades, make it to the finish line without giving up towards the end.
In addition to student voice, parent voice has also been gathered as a part of the process. This incurs at the site level through school site councils and various parent stakeholder meetings and at our system level through various stakeholder meetings um, and discussion around learning loss. This slide right now that you see, it shares some themes that we lifted from discussions that occurred with our superintendent's parent advisory committee last January. And these big, big themes included um, parents giving us feedback around what's helping their children learn, um, really having opportunities for materials pick up at the school site. It strengthens learning at home, but it also reinforces that connection to school. Um, when we talked about what makes their child feel connected to school, there was a real emphasis on that. The relationships matter both in and out of the classroom and that students are really missing their connections with each other, with their peers. Um, they asked us to consider as we transition to hybrid learning to consider ways that we can leverage student relationships and the connections that they have when we're identifying classroom placements and schedules. Lastly, when we asked them about summer learning and what would be engaging in a learning program, they told us that the learning needs to be fun and that any opportunities that we have over the summer need to include student voice as well as choice and should also include enrichment in addition to um, intervention and credit recovery. And so now we're going to take a deeper look into each division's work around um, their improvement journey. And we're gonna start with Mr. Messer, who is the Assistant Superintendent for Secondary. Good evening, thank you, Melissa. So our journey started, our cycle of inquiry journey started from last spring learning um, from our experience on how our students handled distance learning. And knowing coming into the fall, we needed to create some supports immediately and some teams to make sure that we were aware of the same type of concerns around attendance, engagement, motivation, and all those areas. So this fall, each of the high schools created work groups and support teams at their sites in uh, very unique ways from uh, repurposing their campus monitors by bringing them into the office to work as uh, support teams to make contacts with parents to bringing in our vice principals into a larger role of leading work groups because their roles shifted not having to worry about uh, discipline and supervision and things to that effect. So our goal this fall was to try to support our students as best as possible as they came back to school and then track them. And basically all of the fall semester, we worked to try to track some of the key themes that we were seeing with our students. And what we found is that student attendance and engagement was still a struggle from the beginning of the school year and continuing up until today. We also noticed that at, we would need more tutoring and support programs. Well, what we found is that attendance was lacking. It was hard to get the kids uh, to, to uh, participate. Motivation has been a key uh, theme throughout. Uh, we knew that students were not completing work and we knew that based on when we started looking at our initial progress report grades and the, and the DNF rates being higher than normal and trying to wonder why the students were not completing work. And then really the social emotional challenges came very early. We knew that there was so much stress from the spring of the loss of, of you know, activities, uh, you know, graduation um, and all of those types of events that were lost. We knew that we were going to try to do our best to create as much activities through um, our seniors that are presenting to us, you know, programs to engage the students was difficult. So next, Melissa. So we came together and said, okay, what, do, what have we learned? What questions can we ask? You know, we need to be able to uncover what's motivating our students, you know, in distance learning. We needed to find out what role does a practitioner and type of assignment work play? You know, is there a reason why the kids aren't doing the work? And what barriers are existing for preventing students from taking advantage of additional supports or completing their work? And then what can the adults in the system do to engage students? These were all through a lens of the adults. And we realized that we were seeing these trends and these things coming up, but now we needed to really shift our lens and, and go to our students. And how do we get their voice and find out um, what they need from us? Next. So in November, 
uh, late November, early December, the high school uh, student support uh, work group came together and we pulled the data that we had been collecting and we decided that we wanted to put out a, a survey to try to get student voice. And we identified the three key themes that surfaced through the data we gathered from all the high schools that are around academic support services, student motivation, and work completion. And our goal in a very short time between really a week before the end of the semester and just the beginning of the next was to try to get a survey out to each of the high schools. And our goal was really to only get around 100 plus students from each high school to take the survey. We knew it was gonna be very difficult to do a large survey. So we tried to be very targeted, but part of that targeting was we wanted to make sure that we had students with disabilities represented in the survey, as well as our English language learners. And if you can see from the chart, we were able to survey 1,148 students. Uh, and of those students, 118 were students with disabilities, 148 were students, English language learners. And this is, just probably under 10% of our high school population. Typically we're around 12,000 high school students. So we felt pretty good about the coverage of students in our survey. And so we sent the survey out. We turned this around in about two weeks and we got the information back. And the second piece, as you saw in the video today, we also tasked our uh, uh, high schools with providing some of that qualitative feedback in the video. So the video you saw today may have only been three minutes, but I think we probably have an hour plus of, of videos. Next. So some of the data that we captured are around really centered in that motivation, what's motivating our students. And you see in the top left, basically, you know, 25% of the students who responded really said that they're really not motivated you know, it just depends or very low desire uh, during distance learning. Um, but overall, it's still um, only 26% of those students overall said that they were really uh, desired to be there every day. And to the right, distance learning, during distance learning, what motivates you the most? And it, when you look at number one and number two, that, you know, that's great. The number looks good. But you go to number five, 23% of those students said, you know what, I connect better when a teacher connects with me, encourages me, who believes in me. And so we're hearing this theme of connection start to rise. And why students are not motivated? Again, we give them an option to choose um, two to three of these different scenarios. And you can see that the largest percentage of students said, because I miss my friends in social interaction. Again, that disconnection piece. To the right, they also said, because I'm overwhelmed. And so this theme of, of being overwhelmed with their work is starting to really come uh, up more and more often. Um, we're also, if you go all the way to the left, because online learning schedule is challenging. What stood out in this graph uh, for us when we really looked at it is the first column, the dark green column is our EL students. And they were the largest to, uh, group to say, because I miss my friends and social interactions. They also said, because of online learning schedule is challenging and also because there's too many distractions at home. And so we also started to see some themes arising with this group of students that we wanted to look deeper into. Next. Next, we also, what reasons are students not turning in their homework? And again, the number one, they're overwhelmed with too many due dates, too many emails, and it's too difficult to find assignments, directions, unable to keep up with the amount of assignments. You know, the students, although we changed their schedules, they virtually have less classes per day, the work seems to be mounting and it's causing um, a lot of stress in, uh, for our students. We also to the right asked, when asked if they would attend academic support service services, you know, 51% said, you know, they've never attended any tutoring or anything like that, but they were aware of the service. So they knew that there were supports out there chose not to go. Um, but also you can see uh, in uh, blue, we have 30% that said they never heard anything. So we know we have to really focus on our communication better. That's too many kids uh, to say that. And then we asked them, what are the barriers? What's, what's the barriers to attending supports, going to tutoring, getting support? And again, you'll see in the first two columns to the left had the largest response. I'm not aware of the services, which we can see in the graph. But the second column was really myself and my own motivation. And again, calling out the motivation piece is, is just a struggle. 
So this is just a sampling of, of some of the work we've in the, your packet. You have the full survey results that goes into different aspects of those three areas that we have identified. Next. So now as we look at what we've learned from our students and listening to the voices, there are four areas we know we have to, to work on. One is strength in communication and relationships. In terms of communication, what we learned right away is that students, it, uh, emailing students is not the best way to communicate with a teenager these days. Uh, finding uh, text messaging and working through the Google, Google Classroom seems to be a better way uh, to communicate. We've also found the same situation with families that we found, for example, at San Juan High School, when they would use the 971 district landline to call home, no one would answer. But if they would make the call through their Google suite phone system, parents would answer because it would come up a, a non-971 number. So the schools are trying to be creative on how we reach out and, and support connecting with our parents. We know work completion is an issue. We'll continue to explore flexible opportunities for our students. Uh, we started uh, at the end of the semester over the winter break, we started allowing for extended learning opportunities in the form of what we call intersessions. For example, at San Juan High School, they identified around 90 students and uh, that were not going to pass courses and said they would give them the opportunity to work 18 hours over that winter break to raise their uh, grades and pass. And of those 90, I believe about 70 students took advantage of that. And about 50 actually were able to complete those grades through uh, this possibility of extended time. We've continued that also in other ways. Student motivation is probably our strongest area or our hardest area to address as we continue through, through uh, distance learning but we're gonna to continue to provide opportunities. As you know, we've had opportunities for extracurricular activities and athletics to come onto campuses for conditioning programs, <laughs> athletics is starting. We're also continuing to try to provide activities, uh, in-person drive-throughs. Um, uh, last week, Casa Robley had a uh, uh, drive-through award ceremony for kids to pick up their certificates, ways to get kids out in a safe fashion has been key. And then finally, our academic support services. We truly are trying to better connect with the kids, communicate with them um, and find better ways uh, to engage them in tutoring because we know we, we're going to need more opportunities for support services and we're gonna need more time to help them recover their grades. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jim Shoemaker. All right, thank you, Rick, and good evening. At the middle school level, we adopted a theme we called everyone as a detective mentality. And our goal really was to reach out to every middle school family to learn more about their needs and their barriers. Specifically, how had their needs and their barriers changed since the spring of 2020? And how could we help? And our detective work led us to realize uh, quite a few things, but specifically, we had made some assumptions about families' abilities to navigate distance learning and we also needed to continue to personalize our responses to students and their barriers. The next slide. To personalize our efforts, we identified every student that was struggling or missing school. We wanted to know why. We wanted to know who could be deployed to help immediately and what next steps should we consider. And our personalization led us to discover some themes. Specifically, staying motivated is hard, Isolation is tough, relationships matter, and we need to keep it fun. As you heard Melissa call out some of those even earlier. Uh, we've been primarily speaking to parents at this point about obstacles and barriers. So we began conducting empathy interview sessions with our students and asking them additional questions with the goal of really better understanding their story, their challenges, their barriers, and what we could do to help. Uh, next slide. So what we heard and learned fell into these four categories in the relationship area. Essentially, it was our students value and need relationships. And I think that's not a surprise. Uh, but what was interesting was it was not only with their friends, but with their teachers. And many of them commented that that was really hard to do via Zoom, no matter how hard anyone tried. In the isolation area, 
Our kids, as we know, thrive on being connected to others. Several students commented that their COVID bubble is too tight. And when we asked, what, what does that mean? It, it just meant that they were, they were so limited in who they could hang out with, where they could go, and who they could physically be with, that it was just really, really weighing on them. In the motivation uh, grid there, you'll see that the frustration threshold was low and students were really just quick to quit. And underneath that, as we tease that out, uh, was this pervasive feeling of, hey, I'm gonna be able to pass my classes when I get to high school. In short, don't worry, I'll be fine. But right now, I'm, I'm just really not that motivated. Uh, and under the need to keep it fun category, uh, the, every kid almost said this, which was really uh, nice to hear that they thought of school as fun in this, in this time period, but they really said that they missed the cool stuff at school. Uh, next slide, please. So we adjusted and we continue to do so. In each of the grids below, you can see some of the specifics. I'm just gonna to talk to some of the highlights. In the relationships category, um, we, our staff are using individual breakout rooms now to connect with students one-on-one, -on -one, almost like a check-in, like you would do right before class or right when you call a kid out of class. Um, to Rick's point, we're communicating differently. Um, so many of our families and kids responded that they do not check email, but text resonates with them. And we're um, exploring every opportunity we can to do that. In the isolation area, we are creating more and more events online for kids to plug into. And we've even created uh, what we're, are called uh, calming rooms for students. These have areas where, where in spaces where kids can go when they are feeling tough, when they are, when, or, excuse me, when they're feeling isolated, when they're feeling removed or distracted. It's a spot that they can go, get recentered, and come back into class. In the motivation grid, you can see there that we are having very active conversations in departments about essential standards and how we create equitable, equitable grading practices, specifically flexible due dates, grades that reflect knowledge and grades that acknowledge growth. And on the, uh, on the need to keep it fun category, uh, we like to keep it fun too. So this was really easy for our middle school, middle school team to address. Um, the number of school events and positive rewards that we are implementing at our schools has grown exponentially. Uh, our personal recognitions of students has increased significantly. We're doing it for attendance, grades, and just because. Any opportunity we get to uh, recognize kids and try to keep them connected to our school sites is, is being attempted. Even our staff are getting into the mix. Our, our Encina um, middle school principal attended a dance off a couple Fridays and nights ago. And from what I saw on, on uh, their Instagram page, it was very well received. And while not all events are well attended, and we heard that from our student board members that came and presented to the board two weeks ago, many are. And I, I wanted to conclude with this. We had a lunch bunch group of past year two weeks ago with 82 students who showed up to have lunch together. And that's, that same lunch bunch started with two. So we are making progress. We're continuing to work hard. And um, thank you for allowing us to share what we're doing at the middle school level. I'm gonna pass it off to Amber Lee in our elementary division. Thanks so much, Jim. Um, good evening, everyone. I wanna take just a quick moment to thank our learning status work group, um, specifically Jen Lawson and Matt English, who led the work um, for the group and all of the elementary administrators who have gathered data for us that sit underneath what I'm going to share with you tonight. Um, so true to a cycle of inquiry with the elementary division, we took an all hands on deck approach because we knew it was gonna take every single one of us to address all of the learning um, that, that occurred for us. So the elementary, elementary division got together and uh, we talked to families, we talked to students, we talked to staff and four distinct containers of work um, revealed themselves. The first was the student struggles with attendance, um, the struggles with meaningful connections as you've heard um, this evening, uh, struggles continuing with technology and then finally some struggles with assignment completions. Okay, Melissa, thank you. Um, as we learned more from listening, we began to ask ourselves questions um, so that we could get smarter and do better for the kids that we serve every day. Um, we asked these questions of ourselves, of our families, of our staff, of our students. And the questions that we wanted to ask so that we could learn more are here. What are the barriers to students' um, consistent attendance? 
how can we support students in making these connections with their peers? We know they're struggling. We heard that loud and clear as you did this evening. What are the contributing barriers with technology or and continuing barriers with technology? Um, while we've made progress there, we know there's still more work to do. And then how can we better support students in the completion of assignments? Um, we know that there's a struggle there as well. Next slide. So as we began to take a closer look um, from the questions that we asked ourselves, we listened and we learned from what we heard. Staff and families shared that the lagging of Wi-Fi um, and the connectivity there continued to be a struggle and often older siblings were supporting our youngest learners, our five-year-olds, as you can imagine what that might look like to log into their classes. Um, one specific example that was shared that really hit home for all of us as we heard it was um, as sight words are presented to students and there's a lag in Wi-Fi, what students may see on the screen may not align with what the teacher is sharing. So we know there are still some inconsistencies um, regarding the Wi-Fi and the lagging situation there. Um, students did tell us that they are missing their friends and they wanted to see them more. They wanted to see them at lunch. They were missing the playground. They're missing playing games together. And they are asking us for more connections and opportunities to have fun together in this environment outside of their um, learning that goes on every day. The kids and parents also shared that the materials pickup has become something um, that's taken on a life of its own. It's something that has become cherished because it's a moment for everyone to be there and see each other and they want and need these connections. So we heard loud and clear that materials pickup has actually taken on another role besides the distribution of materials. Our English learners did share that they feel successful in their English language development classes, um, but that wasn't always the case in their regular classes. And so we saw inconsistencies with attendance um, there. And we also saw that if they didn't understand the other classes that they were in, their attendance um, became weaker in those areas. Our families did share that sometimes the social needs of their kids took a priority and it was a necessity for the families to make a decision oftentimes between classwork, um, assignment completion, and sometimes there was just too much work um, to be completed in one day in this environment for our youngest learners. Next slide. And so this is where we really um, had to take a hard look at what we learned and what we heard and quickly adjust and pivot. So to adjust to some of the attendance needs, we learned that teachers responded quickly by reaching out to students one-on-one -on -one, as principals also were reaching out and making one-on-one -on -one connections to try and engage all students and all families and find out what those barriers were and eliminate them on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, incentives linked to social connections are something that has been offered at many, many school sites. Um, buddy reading um, opportunities, school-wide dance parties, assemblies, lunch bunch gatherings are just a few that I can name. Um, and if, if you are interested in participating in any of those with us, please, please reach out. I can give you a list of opportunities um, to go and join kids with these um, connection type activities. To help our students with those connections, teachers are holding more and more small group opportunities and continuing to enhance and leverage those connections during materials distribution, whether it's handing out an award, a Valentine, or something to just recognize the kids and the hard work that they're doing. With the assignment completion, um, some of our adjustments just boil right down to understanding and compassion and being more flexible with due dates and the number of assignments that are being given. Um, just listening and learning from the families about what's tolerable and what's manageable and what's not. And then finally, um, in the last container there with technology, as the elementary division pivoted into this learning environment, our school offices also quickly pivoted into many technology support centers where they're providing opportunities um, to families on a case-by-case -case basis 
teachers were often willing to record and reteach missed lessons due to any technology issues. Um, we just saw an overall willingness to respond and support as best we could when it came to the lack of connectivity. Um, and as I say all of this, I, I also say keep in mind that these are our youngest learners and um, they're often being guided by their siblings at home and supported. And we heard that today and tonight. Now with all of this, we keep learning and we keep asking questions. It doesn't stop here. Um, the elementary division is out asking more questions because we will continue in cycles of inquiry as we progress through this year so that we can do better for our kids and better for our families. So next, as a part of this presentation, you are going to hear an amazing story, an amazing project that has grown to life because of this empathy gathering, because we have a vice principal who is out there listening and learning intensely and intently. Um, I want to pass this presentation to an amazing gentleman, an amazing vice principal, and a general all around fantastic human being, Jamal Hicks. Oh, thank you very much, Amberly. Thank you very much. Um, a little bit of background about the grant. Um, in partnership with Sac Republic and from the guidance of Kate Hazarian, a grant was awarded for Micron. The purpose of this grant was to close gaps from our underserved students. The initial team met and they discussed what is the best way we can use the money to support our students. You guys guessed it. You know, we just want to buy more Chromebooks, more hotspots, more headsets. However, the team decided to empathy gather with their families so that we can identify the best needs for the grant. From the collaboration, we found that voices were missing. When those voices were finally amplified, the idea of the grant went a completely different direction. Nina Mancina worked with myself years ago, back in the day at Jonah Salk. And we worked together on a previous project called Gen Yes. She reached out to me and said, Jamal, what do you think? I said, one last time. She replied, one last time. <laughs> now, buckle up. You can cuddle up. You guys can even zoom up and see what happens when you include community voice in a leadership team that is committed to serving all its stakeholders. Ladies and gentlemen, hold on. Keep your minds open. Next slide, please. West, West in support and technology. The purpose of West, and I'm sharing a thought that came that came that I came across in a collaborative meeting, a West End meeting that I attended. I just wanted to just kind of just speak personal just for a second, but we really need to get away from focusing on the negative labels we attach to learning. I can't count the number of times I would personally cringe when the topic of the achievement gap came up, because I knew deep down inside we were talking about our brown and black students. So Melissa, please don't get too mad. I'm not gonna have you erase anything, but the purpose of West is to accelerate learning by supporting our families academically and technologically with equipment, trainings and tools to excel in distance learning and beyond. Next slide, please. Here's a little video that would give you just a little taste of what West is about. Next slide, please. So um, before I get started, I wanted to thank you for allowing my voice to be heard in this platform. I wanted to add that I'm in awe of our families, our students, our teachers, our leadership, because we're all doing a brand new job, a brand new job that nobody has ever done before. And there's some discomfort, yet we do it for our students. West will provide technical support and make our equipment more accessible to our families, 
perhaps we can even really accelerate our students' learning. Additionally, language and tra transportation is a huge barrier in the west end of our district. So let's pause. Let's look at this from the lens of some of our families. One, you have challenges in English and your access to transportation at times is not consistent. Oh, and you need to get your first grader to upload a photo to, your, to a teacher's Google Classroom. Wait a minute, wait a minute. If your first grader don't upload the photo, you're marked absent. And a potential phone call is coming from the principal. Oh, wait a minute, sorry, my bad. A little flash. Sorry about that, you guys. Let me stop before I really make a phone call right now to a family. Let me breathe. So additionally, we wanna build a sense of pride from our community. The families from the West are dope. I mean, wait, did I just say that? Let me say that again. Our families are incredible. When you know and you believe you are something, you act accordingly. Our students from the West End matter. This is the sentiment that we want to grow. This is a perfect time in which we can invest in our currency. Our currency is our students and the focus of West is to shine the light on that notion, our currency. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so here at the site, here at the school, here are the school sites that will get, that will get focused West services. We wanna start small have a strong foundation and create a system in which we could expand. Next slide, please. These are the sites that will have access to the walk-in lab. They can make an appointment where they can get one-on-one -on -one support with a tech expert in their, in their own language. Next slide, please. So kind of just to summarize how Wes is going to serve our community. One, we'll have a walk-in support lab. Two, uh, we'll have some phone support for questions and concerns about distance learning and our families' languages. Three, we'll have a mobile unit that will make scheduled stops throughout the community. Four, there'll be a web-based remote learning engagement hub that will be accessible through the San Juan portal. And lastly, and my favorite is the mobile app. Next slide, please. We have a variety of people who have gotten together to make this happen. I wanted to give a special shout out to our coordinator, Clarissa, Clarissa Alva, our valuable face employee, big dog Anthony Brooks and Leslie Leatherwood and Keel Leatherwood, our Thomas Edison support staff and our currency, of course, our students. There's a list of our students right there. And I just wanna highlight that the students will be, will be providing support in these languages. Next slide, please. Let's focus on exactly how West, what West will look like. Our walk-in hub will be open Tuesdays through Thursdays from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. It'll be staffed by FACE employees, staff members from Edison, and our bilingual high school volunteers. Yes, we're putting our students to work. The mobile unit will be available Tuesdays through Thursdays from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. The unit will be staffed by the West Director and, our, and, a, and a school community worker. The mobile app is in development. The reason why is we're just trying to, we're trying to be like Amazon 2.0. I mean, I was just really kind of just thinking about it and fantasizing about it. And I would love for a family to be able to make, to request their items. You know, I need a, a, a sorry, a hotspot, a Chromebook, put in this parking slot that they're in, and then we can just bring the items out to them. You guys want to talk about a curb service. Uh, next slide, please. So the web-based distance learning hub or remote engagement hub will answer the questions that that will answer the question that appeared in our empathy gathering. Our families told us loud and clear that they needed one location to virtually house information about tools for them to reduce the confusion and the frustration. They additionally stated that they wanted a way to, to contact or to reach out to the school during off hours. Next slide, please. So this hub, I mean, this hub will provide students and families with attended groups, uh, student schedules, Zoom information, Google Classroom access, families, teachers, students, and other staff can access resources and support by filling out the West support ticket. Next slide, please. Again, we just wanted to thank our generous donors for making the West possible for our students and families. This is West in support in technology. Next slide, please. The data uh, that we derive from West will show that we are uh, making a positive impact on student learning and growth. Additionally, data will help us serve our community by defining their social and emotional needs. Uh, next slide, please. 
This program is just like a springboard for opportunities in which we can connect with partners throughout the district and community. An example of our work, uh, of our work through the West program is, uh, is through the partnership we actually already formed, we already formed. Let me introduce you to Mr. Daryl Jenkins. Next slide, please. Hello, this is Daryl Jenkins, uh, past president of 100 Black Men, uh, current board member. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, just wanted to thank uh, Mr. Hicks for coming back our way. We have been a partner with Mr. Hicks when he was at uh, Jonas Salt. And, and some of you may remember that 100 Black Men put on an annual uh, African-American male conference. Now we call it the uh, youth conference because we include everyone. And uh, um, what we did there was how he helped us, and this was some years ago, to introduce technologies to young people. And I'll quickly go through what happened. We used to have young men come through and, you know, come to a, uh, a session and uh, put their arms together, put their heads down and, and try to just ignore it until it was time to go. And then Mr. Hicks's program opened up their eyes until um, we couldn't get them to leave the room. So uh, it excited me to work with him. And it, we plan to do more of that in, in a partnership, working with uh, the 100 Black Men and doing our mentoring program. For those of you who do not know who the 100 Black Men are, we are a 35-year-old organization. We're connected with 100 Black Men of America, which is a national and international mentoring program. With, uh, we won uh, 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 many awards and worked with uh, lots of national people. Our chapter, the Sacramento chapter, had won the mentoring uh, chapter of the year award back when I was president of the organization. Um, let me give you some, some insights on what we're, our plans are and what we're doing now in current schools. Uh, we're doing Lego robotics programs. If you've been to a Lego's comp competition, we had young people that had never been exposed to technology, planning, programming, and actually were the first ones at this program a year ago to make the robot uh, get a ball and then throw it into a basket. We were so excited, it was, it was incredible. And these young people have gone on to do great things. We're also now uh, uh, involved with uh, a drone uh, uh, programming, uh, developing operational and development. So we're doing drones in our program. So this will track to the career opportunities for young people in the future. And, we, and that's one of the things that we do mostly in our, in our mentoring is try to do career pathing so that you know, education tracks with careers, so that there is a vision of what you're going to be doing when you get out of school, and the reason why you go to school. The purpose is of, of developing a pattern and a lifestyle and a career for yourself to support your families. Um, the other thing that uh, we like to talk about is scholarships. We work with scholarships uh, and develop scholarship programs and work with scholarship organizations so that young people can get a scholarship by the time they graduate from, from high school and move into a college of their choice. Um, we want to also uh, talk about quickly, I know, um, uh, supporting uh, in, uh, independent development and, and, and individual engagement. That is probably the most critical thing that we see the young people lack is that they have no desire to know why they live and exist. The, the challenge for young people now is that there's no vision or dream of what the future is. We try to give them a, a relative uh, uh, dream that is about what's happening in our society today. I mean, pick out something, there's all kinds of things that they, these young people come up with, but can they make money out of it? Can they build a career? Can they build a company? And can they use it? to uh, enhance the life of other people and people in the society. Uh, let's see, the last thing I'd like to talk about is the support of the people that we have. We have judges, lawyers, and uh, people who are in blue collar jobs, all who are all volunteers who come in and work with the young people. We do it uh, uh, two Saturdays a month 
and we do it at a location and we provide lunches and we provide uh, uh, the opportunity for the young people to express themselves, to find what it is that they do, that they're good at, as well as how do they implement that and grow? You know, they shock us most of the time because they're good at so many different things, but nobody asks them. You know, they, we ask them to do a project and they, some, somebody says, I can draw that. Uh, I can build that. And then they find themselves being uh, involved in things that they learn and says, well, how can I find out? Your school has these opportunities. And it seems like they don't ask anybody. So it will relate with, uh, I think there was a, a gentleman by the name, I don't know his first name, Rick, that talked about all of the things that his survey identified that the youth do not have. And those are the types of things that we love to know and then work with the youth and the parents and the guardians and the grandparents to figure out how we uh, stimulate these young people and keep them away from drugs and gangs. So uh, we work with the police. Uh, the police chief is my a good friend of mine. He's a hunter black man. He used to be a hunter black man before he became police chief. So I will leave you with that. There's more I could say, but I think that's enough to get you started in thinking about we believe that what they see is what they'll be. Thank you very much, Daryl Jenkins. Thank you, though, Mr. Jenkins. So you, you guys could just feel my excitement. I mean, you hopefully you really, really can know. And I'm just, this was very fortunate to be in this opportunity right now. Um, as you can see some of the other programs that actually accompany the, the 100 Black Men. And so this is all just really just started from the, uh, just West and just really where we want to go. So just, I want to close with this. And and I share the, and Ken and I were talking about this. I just really feel right now we're planting and watering the seed of something that could be really one of the greatest gifts from COVID. Don't tell anybody that, but really, this could be one of the greatest gifts of COVID. That gift being where school sites and communities are working together as one for one sole purpose, our students. I do have to close with this just because that's just me. I just have to be true to myself. And I just really do have to say just with Mr. Jenkins, I really do feel we can't improve as a district until we start addressing the needs and concerns of our African-American students and families. With that, I close. I just wanna thank you for this time this evening. We would like now to open up to the board for questions you might have. Thank you very much to the team for the presentation. I'm now gonna turn it over to my colleagues for um, questions or comments. We'll begin with Mr. Hernandez. President Viasquez, if I could interrupt, oh, if you would I'm like to sorry. perhaps offer for public comment. Thank you, Mr. Allen, for keeping me in order. Um, Mr. Allen, do we have any public comments at this time on this item? Uh, we do have three hands raised at this time. Uh, so if you'd like, I will begin with those. Sure, I just wanna um, remind um, our community partners still with us that this will be public comment for our um, business item, general visitor comment follows um, later um, for the agenda. Um, so Mr. Allen, please go ahead with the public comment. Thank you, President Viasquez. Our first comment will be from Ben Avey. Mr. Avey, when you are ready, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. Um, I am a member of the Superintendent's Parent Advisory Committee. I think one other thing that came out of that group um, was us just acknowledging that there's a lot of parents that aren't heard, that don't have the ability to engage in those parent groups. Um, and those are the ones that we as parents within the community are hearing from that, that are struggling the most. So we just wanted to highlight that as a gap um, and kind of part of our bias and who we are and what our reporting is and we can't report for everybody. I did wanna ask one quick question is how is San Juan Unified doing um, with student learning among uh, California Department of Education identified student groups compared to other schools. Uh, another parent shared with me that we're actually underperforming in four student groups comparatively, English learners, foster youth, homeless, and students with disabilities. Um, apparently over about 38 school districts have four or more underperforming student groups. We're actually in the bottom 4%. Um, in that. I was curious, is that information accurate? Are we underperforming compared to other uh, school districts at, with English learners, foster youth, homeless, and student with disabilities? Um, and if we are, can staff elaborate on that a bit more? Thank you. 
And thank you for your comment, Mr. Avey. Our next comment will be from Katie Reed. Katie, when you are ready. Good evening. Um, I share one of the same concerns that Ben just voiced, whether San Juan as a district is performing um, the same as, better or worse than other districts in our state. I believe there are close to a thousand districts in California and um, I had maybe been looking at the same, the same dashboard that Ben was looking at that the CDE has identified four student groups in San Juan Unified School District that have been identified for LFCC assistance because those groups are significantly underperforming. I'm wondering if um, there's a reason we're not hearing about that in these board meetings or if the only reason is that I haven't been coming to these meetings and listening until um, COVID and distance learning became an issue. I'm also wondering with regard to the statistics on attendance and grades that were discussed earlier, whether the statistics for attendance that were provided tonight are adjusted based on the teachers being discouraged from marking students absent to keep our numbers looking better, which I have heard personally from teachers in our district. And sort of the same question for grades, are the statistics for grades being adjusted based on the extraordinary lowering of expectations that we're seeing from um, schools and teachers during distance learning? Thank you. And thank you for your comment. Our next comment will be from Benjamin Mark. When you are ready, Benjamin. Hi, good evening. This is actually Karen Mark. I'm a parent of three kids who attend San Juan Unified Schools. The Rapid Learner Program is an accelerated program for children in second through fifth grade. Children are taught material one grade level ahead of their chronologic age. Fifth grade children are taught sixth grade material. The vast majority go on to the Ivy Middle Years Program at Winston Churchill Middle School, the only district school which teaches accelerated sixth grade math. With the move to distance learning, the standardized tests usually used to determine admission were not offered last spring or this fall. Instead, interested students took a non-standardized, non-validated test. Admission cutoff scores were determined after student test results were known, and to date the methodology used to determine this threshold is unclear. Students just under the threshold were invited to submit an essay and other materials for admission consideration, a process obviously subject to vastly differing amounts of parental editing. Some rapid learner students were denied admission who had clearly been on track for admission prior to the pandemic. From my own three children, I have seen that children adapt to distance learning very differently, and hence the toll taken on children is uneven. This uneven effect is seen across the educational spectrum, not only among struggling students, as we saw in terms of increase in Fs, but also among those in accelerated programs. While the district navigates how to safely restart in-person instruction, we must do everything possible to minimize the negative effects of the past year. Denying gifted children who were clearly on track for admission to Churchill prior to the pandemic is unacceptable. There is clearly plenty of space in the program and admitting these children will not displace others. Please ensure that children are not harmed for years to come by being tracked out of accelerated programs as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. And thank you for your comment. Our next comment will come from Ms. Alicia Nichols, when you are ready. I just wanted to thank Mr. Hicks for thinking of our families who needed the additional um, tech support help, as well as offering this help to our EL students and families. Um, I work at San Juan High School, and we have many Yale families who need all kinds of help, and not just with tech help, but like with, you know, financial things and things like that. So I truly appreciate you uh, guys coming up with a program and a way for us to be able to support them. Thank you, Mr. Hicks. And thank you for your comment. Our next comment is from NSayers72, when you are ready. Thank you. I just wanted to let you know, it is appreciated the amount of time and effort and funds that have been put into looking at how to support the district students and faculty with regard to the distance learning, the studies, the polls, the videos, collaboration with the community, no question the effort that's been involved. 
The question that is, however, is why are these efforts, funds, and time not being spent on attorneys or scientists, which have been seen in many other districts at helping to fight the unions? We've heard throughout this call that the unions obviously have a big part in why our students in San Juan Unified School District are not back in school. We have in the history, adults have always been put in a place where children are to be protected. We now are showing that the adults are to be protected at the expense of children. Everyone on this call is aware that the children are our future. As we've heard from many people, we see that the mental health of our children is just astronomical. As someone who sits on a board for Child Abuse Prevention Center, from the beginning of this pandemic, it was indicated that there was a drop of over 40% of calls to child, abuse per, to child abuse hotline. That had to do with eyes on students were gone. They also, was, it was brought up earlier on the call and it has been supported that the severity of abuse being brought into the hospital throughout the United States of children is so high because it's the actual abuser having to bring them in. Our schools are more than just an education place. They are a safe haven for our children. The last piece has to do with grades and absences. For anyone to think that the data that was presented to us today is accurate is very wrong. A, a child that has an A plus in something that they have a tutor with that the parents are paying for and this teacher is still having to help them tells you that the A plus is not accurate. Thank you. And thank you for your comment. And President Viescas, that was our final comment on this item. Thank you, Mr. Allen. At this time, I will turn it over to my colleagues for any questions or comments. Mr. Hernandez? Uh, just a quick comment. I appreciate the report. And more than anything, I appreciate the honesty in the report and the, uh, the outreach to focus on the need. I mean, I, I really appreciate that. And I appreciate the, uh, the video from the West program. It got me very excited to uh, hear uh, Mr. Hicks and to hear what we're, what we're trying to accomplish in these areas to help these, uh, the, these students in, in the West program. And so more than anything, just a comment of appreciation. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Hernandez. Ms. Costa? I had the pleasure of hearing this report at Curriculum and Standards a week ago. And the parents had so many questions. We did not hear the West portion of the presentation and I hope that'll come back to curriculum and standards because it is so exciting. Thank you to Mr. Hicks and to Mr. Jenkins. I think this is addressing the equity issue that we have talked about so often. I got so energized after curriculum and standards. I made phone calls, um, I had attended this the two SPAC meetings. So I had heard parents talking and heard the student voice through this report. And I wondered what principals would say. So the next day after curriculum and standards, I called five elementary principals and asked the same questions that the kids were asked. To a person, the concern was about attendance and making sure every student was there. And they talked about the ways that they were encouraging students to attend the phone calls, the texts, sending people out to families' homes uh, that included the teachers going out, it included our MTSS staff going out, the principals going out. The thing that they were most proud of is the way their certificated and classified staffs were working on behalf of the kids. And they talked about going the extra mile to make sure that students are not falling through the cracks and that they too, when a student is not attending, uh, are very, very concerned and trying to find other ways to reach out. They talked about the uh, materials pickup and just as the students and the parents talked about how positive that was, the principal said it's something that everyone looks forward to. I don't think there is a person in San Juan who doesn't want to come back because we miss the connections. I realized how much I miss connecting with principals and talking with them. Um, and 
I think the report went above and beyond to help us understand what is happening. I really want to thank every one of the staff for putting it together. Thank you, Ms. Costa. Ms. Creason. Thanks for the report. There was a whole lot in there and I have quite a few notes, so bear with me. I'll try to run through them <laughs> in a timely matter. I know it's getting late. Um, first, I wanna refer back to Mr. A's question. I'm pretty sure we probably can't uh, answer those questions right now on the spot about the performance measures, um, how we're measuring up with other districts. I'm wondering, does that data exist somewhere that we can get it at a later date? It, it does, and I'll, I'll go ahead and um, actually, uh, you know, staff can jump in too, but it does, and we actually get fairly regular updates from the dashboard, and there'll likely be one coming this spring, but the answer is yes, it's publicly available data. Okay, and so I think that, um, Mr. A.V., if you'd like to reach out with me an email, we can send you that link or tell you how to get that information, or for anyone else that's looking for that information, um, I'm happy to post it on my social media pages too, so folks can quickly get to it. Um, I'm going to first run through some more public comments that I heard, and then I'll get to my other comment. Um, just want to, just a shout out to the person that had talked a little bit about the, their kid or kids that are around them in accelerated programming and that they're having, they're worried about what this means for next year. And I just want to let you know, you know, it's a struggle we're dealing with at my house too. My son was able to get into IM1 in eighth grade. Um, don't know he's going to pass that class. Um, so I just wanted to share that. You know, it's a really, it's a very real struggle. Um, I'm not capable of helping him with his homework and I have an MBA. Um, and so it's, it's challenging. And I do want to also recognize uh, someone had mentioned tutoring and is that really an A? And I mean, my perspective is, yeah, sure. I mean, tutors happen whether we're in person or not. Um, and if the kid got an A, they got an A. But what worries me more in that situation is all the kids that can't afford it, right? You know, the inequity that's caused, um, you know, the inequity there, you know, everyone that can't get to a tuner for whatever reason, um, and that's problematic. So I hear that. Um, I also wanna address another comment I heard is unions are the reason why we're not in school. Um, I think um, for those of you that were on the call earlier today, um, I'm just gonna have to repeat it just in case folks didn't hear it. Um, I'm all about the science and I'm all about the state guidelines. I think I understand hearing from public comment tonight that Maybe folks don't think that we should follow state guidance, but that's a completely different conversation. Um, that's the box we're in, and I think it is important um, for a variety of reasons that I'm happy to talk about offline. But until 12 o'clock today, and staff, others, correct me if I'm wrong, until noon today, we could not reopen, and that was not the union's fault. Um, now, where we go from here is you know, something we need to talk out, and I hope that we can revisit the agreement, and I have comments about that in a minute. So. Um, I want to say I really enjoyed Mr. Hicks' presentation. It's just wonderful to see you. It's been a long time. I really enjoyed my time with you um, at Edison. Um, I even got a text from a friend that's watching, just really enjoyed your presentation and your energy um, and everything that you're doing. And um, just thank you. It's wonderful to see you. Um, regarding attendance, I'm wondering if we could go back to that a little bit and just dive a little bit deeper into what adjustments were made um, to... Like, what do we do for attendance? Because I know that we had to, it's not the same as a kid just showing up to school. So what are our measures for, you know, a kid receiving credit for being in class? And I know we touched on it, but if we could talk more about it and maybe a little bit about the rationale as to why it's not necessarily you're in the Zoom the entire time, et cetera. So it, it includes a comb any kind of uh, combination in terms of participation in the synchronous or in the asynchronous. It can also include um, contact, teacher contact with the home. Um, and so, and this is all per legislation. So that's, that's how those metrics were identified to help us um, account for attendance. Thank you for sharing that. So the rationale really is we're following state legislation on how we have to account attendance yes. based to this reality. And I heard someone mention, and I actually got a couple of calls about this, that there is a concern that maybe guidelines um, aren't being followed. Um, I would say maybe, I would say two things. I would say, if you're seeing a problem, please come to us with specifics so we can look into it. Because maybe someone's confused and just needs some guidance. But if we, you know, it's a, a big district with 60 plus schools and lots of teachers and lots of classes. So if we don't know specifically where there may be a problem, um, we can't do much about it. So if you specifically think the guidelines 
that have been set in place by legislation are being violated or misunderstood. We really would like to hear that, but again, we need specifics to address it. Um, I want to say that I really appreciated the good and the bad comments. You know, I shouldn't say good and bad, but the challenges and the successes <laughs> um, in the student presentation. I know it's it's hard. It's hard to hear, especially when we're working with our kids and. We of course want to always put our best foot forward, you know. Um, so I think it does take take a lot of courage <laughs> to really tell the whole story. And I think throughout this process, we've done that really well. I don't know that we've uh, put rose lenses on everything. So I just want to call out that I really appreciated both lenses because we do need to hear it. We all need to hear it. Um, super concerned. I know we all are really, really concerned about, of course, the learning loss in general. Um, really concerned about the disparity and inequity in what we're seeing in the declines. Uh, wondering if somebody can touch a little bit on will there, and I know this is being worked out. I don't know if there's a lot we could share today or not, but you know, I know we're talking about learning loss specifically. How are we going to address that? What are we going to do to help kids catch up? And so I guess, can someone share a little bit of what that's going to look like or where those conversations are going and will kids have grace to catch up next year? There are a lot of uh, pieces that are in play right now. And so um, specifically, so our high school team is looking at a variety of strategies. We've had um, opportunities for um, intercession and boot camps right now for students to um, either uh, credit recovery or, and as well as catching up. Um, we're looking at possibly opening up something that's called, a, they're calling it a twilight program, which will provide additional opportunities in the evenings for students to um, catch up. Summer learning is going to be an opportunity for us to really focus on the credit recovery, but also add in opportunities for enrichment and potential acceleration. So that's another point of opportunity for us. And that we'll see that throughout our, our K-12 system. Um, it's our intention to work in partnership and be as creative as possible, really um, leveraging high interest for students and their voice, um, as well as from our community in order of in shaping that as well. Um, some other pieces that we are considering um, are the potential for the modification of graduation requirements for a particular cohort that may be adversely reflect, affected right now. So that is also in the works. Um, so there's a lot of different strategies that we're looking at to um, address some of what you talked about. Thank you for that. And do we have a timeline on when we're going to be sharing this, when we're going to be ready to share this with families so folks know what they can access and how to access? Um, Probably it's going to take us about a, um, in the next few, like four to six weeks, I would say. We have a meeting tomorrow, um, one of the first of many. We've had staff that have been working on um, strategies to address learning in the summer. Um, mm -hmm. but we have a more formalized meeting happening tomorrow um, to help uh, propel us in our planning for that. Thank you. Um, I want to call out that although, of course, we need to be focused on reopening and getting kids back on campus, I am really happy that we are still spending time to make distance learning the best it can be because that is the bucket we have been in. And we are committed to ensuring that families continue, families have a choice if they want to continue with distance learning after we reopen. Um, so I want to call out that I'm just really happy that we are still doing the work to deliver the best product we can and best education we can in that model. So we continue to offer choice um, because we have both sides of the coin. There's people that are not ready to go back for a variety of reasons. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, so <laughs> you guys are going to love this one. Really a lot of what we heard today, you know, the, from the, from the videos and from the statistics is reopening would really help a lot of this, help with the connections, help with a whole lot. And we were able to talk a little bit about that earlier today, but I'm just, now that I've had a little time to think it through, I'm just wondering, you know, I know that we have to go and make new agreements and have new conversations, which have already started with SJTA and our other um, bargaining groups. But I'm wondering as a board, is there anything that we can do today to shorten the process on our end? We, I would hate for an agreement to be made tomorrow and it has to wait for us to convene again um, in whatever time frame or in two weeks, is there anything or any action we can take today so that we have put our stamp of approval on reopening with, you know, and then you guys can and just bless the next step. Is there anything we could do today in that way in action? 
I'll, I I'll told take, you it was going to be heavy. <laughs> I, I, I don't think there is because I don't think the board can take action on something that's not really formally agendized. Um, and you know, there there are a lot of aspects even to a demand to bargain that go into effect. Um, you know, and that's all part of the process. I also know that that once we would get to an agreement, we will actually have to submit what our plans are based on that agreement to the county, and then they will have a week to actually respond to us. So if people think that we're gonna be able to turn around immediately and see a change, that's, that's unrealistic. And I just wanna be really honest with folks. Um, so there's, there are steps that we need to go through um, and so I don't really believe there's any action the board could take tonight that would expedite anything. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Creason. Dr. McKibben. Okay, I'll try to do, do this as quickly as I can. Uh, I have about six, uh, six quick questions, I hope. The first one is on slide 25, uh, talked about care solace, and I believe was mentioned a couple of other places. Will information related to care uh, solace and, and the results of it, the numbers and that sort of thing be in the agenda item that I believe, Mr. Yes. Month from now? Yes, it will. Okay, thank you. That's, that I'll wait. Uh, uh, the second one is, um, related to the assignments from slide 28, is there any evidence that the, assign, uh, uh, the assignments that are be given, being given this year, because it, was, it seemed to be at, at all grades that the students were feeling that they had lots of assignments or, or it seemingly sounded like more assignments. Is there any evidence at all that they're, they're getting more assignments this year in distance than they were last year when it was live? Melissa, are you okay if I grab that one? Okay. What we are hearing is that it's the combination of synchronous and asynchronous, um, not in comparison to last year, but um, given the fact that some of them are completing assignments when parents get home from work. So there's limited time to complete assignments and it's all kind of compounded into those, those few hours that are left in the day. Does that help? Yes, it does. Thank anybody else? Want, I appreciate it. Anybody else want to work on that one from a high school or middle school level? Yeah, I, I'd be more than happy to. I think, you know, as, as we're growing and learning uh, in distance learning, not only the learning part, but the teaching part of it, the aspect is we're, we're hearing, you know, from students that they're overwhelmed with the amount of work. Um, but what we're hearing also on the other side is, you know, there's a limited amount of, of time uh, for instruction this year compared to what they usually would have. And so trying to meet, you know, meet the standards, get through the curriculum, um, you know, students are feeling like it's piling up. So I, I think it's a mix of, of just being new and, and on one side of it, and then the teachers having worked towards their curriculum and trying to get through it is causing, you know, uh, some of this to, to come forward. Okay. Let me move to my next question, and it's probably back to Amber Lee again. Amber Lee, you talked about uh, uh, materials pickup uh, taking a life of its own, and uh, and can you expand a little bit of what you meant by that, and and what's the lesson lesson learned out of that, and what ought we what should we be doing different that we because of this lesson? So it's a. I'm so glad you asked about materials pickup because it is it is a bright spot in terms of life of its own. Um, initially, the intention of materials pickup was just to distribute materials and supplies that kids might need, whether it's um, packets or photocopies of things that they needed, or whether it was um, crayons and pencils and markers. The life of its own that it's taken on beyond that is really this um, connectivity piece where kids are able to see one another, whether it's in cars and waving out windows as they drive by and pick up their materials or shout from across the parking lot. That's really the life of its own. And I think lessons learned um, that you ask about that. The lesson learned is that 
sometimes the things that we don't expect show up and we learn about that by talking to our families and communities and kids. And we now know that it's something that they love. And as um, Mrs. Costa had mentioned, it's something that the principals and the staff love too. They're all missing each other. And so the life of its own is really about that social emotional component. Thank yeah. you for asking. Oh yeah, uh, just, so, just so that Mr. Shumay doesn't feel left out. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, a couple of the questions related to middle school and assignments and grades. Yeah, I, I've heard more than once people say, well, middle, uh, uh, middle school grades really don't matter uh, because they're going to be uh, led into high school regardless of how many Fs or, or Ds that they have. Uh, and it sounds like that issue is compounded even greater during our time of distance learning. Uh, uh, and uh, Mr. Shumate, will you comment on that? And I, I hope you'll disagree with me. <laughs> well, I wish I could. I really wish I could. Uh, my, you know, that I race back to my middle school days and there's, uh, and I was a good, student and a rule follower and there was there was moments where i thought you know this isn't going to be the end of the world if i don't get the a in this class or the b and, and I, I think that that same mentality has been compounded in this in this time period and what what has i think compounded at most is that interaction with the teacher where the bell rings the kids leaving class and the teacher says hey jim can i talk to you for a second and there's a connection that happens there there's a little relational um, conversation that goes on and there's a, there's a request from the teacher like, hey, I'm worried about you. You seem to be falling behind. What can I do to help you? And that usually is enough to kind of snap that that most kids into, OK, I, I got called on my behavior. I need to respond or there's, you know, there's a phone call home oftentimes, too. And that that's a little that's a lot harder to do in Zoom. We have started the little breakout rooms that I talked about where teachers are starting to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with kids, but um, it, it, it is a, a pervasive feeling at the, at the middle schools that it's something that we work daily to try to, to help kids understand that this is foundational learning and they, they need to get it right before they head to high school. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, it, yeah. There's there's a lot of stuff there to work at, and, I, and this this I want to thank all of you for for the work that you did on this study. There's just a lot of data here that I could spend about a half hour doing of that sort of thing, but my fellow board members would kill me. Uh, and I want to move to my next question. Um, I want to be invited to uh, one of the lunch bunches, uh, either the one uh, Jim that you talked about, where the 82 students. Or, or uh, I think it was uh, talked about at other places too. But please put me on your invite list uh, for those. Those sound like really terrific uh, things for me to be a fly on the wall and, and listen to. Uh, and and finally, I want to go to the uh, the grant, uh, the the West grant, and and a couple of things. I I'm very impressed with that. But I wanted to ask a couple of questions. We have uh, uh, either uh, uh, Mr. Hicks uh, or Mr. Uh, in particular, we have other kinds of, of groups, for example, Project Optimism and Improve Your Tomorrow that are also working with similar kinds of population. Is there any connection between the kinds of groups the, that uh, uh, have have shown very promising results just as this done in terms of do, do you talk to each other do you work in league with each other is there any connection between you I feel like you were just like like you were planted in my presentation oh we're already partnering partnering with them though so yes okay. there's a huge connection and okay we, that would like, make sense they will like provide like a satellite office though for them but yeah you're not a plant but no yes we are <laughs> okay. you know. I, have my, I got my notepad too. I was ready. I'm ready though, my brother. I'm ready for you. Okay. I will, uh, well, while you're there, I want to okay. ask uh, the other thing. Uh, the grant that you have, uh, you said it was from uh, Sacramento Republic. How yeah. long? How long is the grant? And because uh, 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 I saw the, it looked like it was a one one year piece. One year and piece. and what are the what are the uh, uh, and and again, congratulations on the on the work you're doing. It is very impressive, 
uh, again, please invite me uh, to come and see what you're doing because this is really impressive stuff and so forth. And I've seen seen other things like the Improve Your Tomorrow and the Project Optimism and and you're all making an enormous difference. And even using the word scholars yes. when you talk about those kids, that's 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 a big deal. It is a huge but, thing. And but tell me a little bit about the future of this grant and the future of this program. Well, the grant, you know, it's a one time deal, but I'm just I mean, I'm kind of hoping the district will we can go further beyond with this. You know, so like just I was just, just I was saying before, you know, we're just kind of planting the seeds though right now. So we're just kind of planting right now. So it's kind of just it's kind of where our community kind of really wants to go with this. If that I don't know if I'm answering your question. Dr. McKibben, I can I can build off that as well. We had the opportunity to meet with Jamal. What was that last week, Jamal? Yeah, correct? last week, yes. Uh -huh. And and we really just said it even with um, a significant amount of possible one time funds that we were gonna get, I said, Jamal, let's as he said, start small, mm -hmm. but let's start to, to envision how we can build this larger. And then I really see as we've been talking about um, concentration dollars that we get or supplemental funds that we get, these are the kind of programs that we need to pilot. And then when we see them working, then that's where we invest our ongoing dollars in as well. And that was the kind of conversation we had with Jamal last week when we met with him because, and, and the reason Ms. Costa didn't see this was, I think it was last Wednesday, I think that we met Jamal, Wednesday or Thursday. Yeah, and Wednesday. we completely, I just said, we need to add this piece into the board presentation because it really puts into action what we were talking about. Um, so I, I believe like Jamal does that this is just the start of this and three, four, five, six years down the road, who knows what it could really look like. We just have to, we have to commit and support to it as a district. I totally agree, and we'll talk tomorrow. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and uh, okay, that's those are my six questions. That's enough for me for for All tonight. Right. <laughs> there's this is a great this is a great stuff. Yes, it is. Thank you, Dr. McKibben. I want to echo the thanks. I mean, the great part of this work, I think, is Superintendent Kern just kind of mentioned. Uh, I, ideally, we're trying out and investing things that in things that work. Um, pandemic or no pandemic. I mean, a lot of the things in here um, do not require a global crisis to engage in. So that's the good news. Um, and so uh, look forward to hearing more about um, your success and, and what it would look like to continue, um, continue these efforts. Um, we've certainly got a lot of hard work ahead of us. So thankful to um, the whole team who um, is all in to make sure that we're meeting the, the challenges ahead of us. So thank you very much for um, the presentation to the whole team. And seeing no further comments or questions at this time, we are at item G2, the PAR Supplementary Retirement Plan. Mr. Oropalo, please begin when you're ready. President Vasquez, members of the board, Superintendent Kerr, Ms. Cunningham. Superintendent is recommending the board adopt resolution number 3022 approving the Public Agency Supplemental Retirement Services Plan, or PARS, and accept the resignation of 223 employees who are enrolled in the plan. And I'm here to answer any questions that you have about this. And President Viasquez, let me share a little bit more before we turn it over to you. As, as uh, Paul mentioned, we had 223 folks from all the different bargaining groups. Uh, I shared with the board a spreadsheet of each of the areas really um, identifying positions that would be vacant. Uh, I think, for example, for our classified employees, we've identified, we'll, we'll have to reduce some positions based on this, but in working with our bargaining groups, we were able to identify 28 and a half positions to cut. Out of those, 23 and a half were vacant, three were because of retirement, so there will only be two bumps, which is much fewer than we would normally see. We're projecting a savings going forward over a five-year period uh, they had calculated a savings of 787000 Through our own analysis, we believe that number could possibly, utilizing multiple funds, be, be twice as much, almost twice as much of that, but likely uh, a minimum of a million dollars over that period of time. So in two weeks from now, we would be bringing forward to the board a PKS list, uh, which is uh, the kind of the layoff list, but it's it's a reduction of positions. It doesn't mean folks would get laid off, 
Uh, so I had committed to the board when we first had this conversation last year, commit again to the board, that as we bring this forward, it would be a benefit to the district, to both our employees, and as well as cost effective. And that is a commitment that we are able to assure you that is, is happening um, with this item coming forward for action. Thank you, Superintendent Kern. Um, at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Allen, see if we have any public comments on this item. We have not received any written comments on this item, nor do we have any hands raised at this time. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Do any board members have questions or comments on this item? Mr. Hernandez? No comment or questions, thank you. Ms. Costa? No. Ms. Creason? Just thankful that we were able to come up with, our staff was able to come up with alternative ways to handle the budget crisis that is to come that didn't lead to a bunch of actual layoffs and losing staff. So I just appreciate all the forward thinking um, so that you know, it will ease the blow that we know is going to come to our budget. Thank you, Ms. Creason. Dr. McKibben? Uh, again, thanks uh, to everybody that worked on this. Uh, and comparing it to this year to last year, we started earlier. I think it was clear this year. And, and uh, uh, I, I do believe that it will truly benefit the district. Thank you very much. And President Viasquez, it does look like one hand might have been raised right as we were doing that. So Mr. Allen, I think that's a new hand that came up, correct? Uh, that hand did come up after I had called for public comment, but I'm happy to go back if uh, we would like. We're still at the agenda item. I hadn't seen it. I don't have on my screen the, the raise your hand piece. So thanks for bringing it to my attention. Happy to entertain that public comment since we're still on the item. Mr. Allen, go ahead. And we will have a public comment from Chrissy Jones. Chrissy Jones, when you are ready, please. Hi, I was just listening to everybody talk about how important these school pickup days are to these students and I wasn't gonna say anything, but I heard today that there are some schools where the teachers are being forced to stay in their classrooms with closed doors and they can only wave to the students from the window. And my understanding is that is a district suggestion or guideline or a rule. And I would like the district to reconsider that rule after hearing how positive that experience is for these kids, honestly going to pick up their new bath, math book from school once a month, you wouldn't think would mean much, but when they can get it from their teacher and talk to their teacher, it means the world to them right now. Thank you. And we do not have any other hands raised at this time, President Viasquez. Okay, thank you. Um, this is an action, an action item. item, and I just want to make sure I got, I think I got through our lineup. Dr. McKibben, I got to you, right? Yes, you got through me. <laughs> My memory is failing me. My apologies. So this is an action item. Is there a motion to adopt resolution number 3022, approving the public agency retirement services supplementary retirement plan and accept the resignation of 223 employees who enrolled into the plan? So moved. Second been moved by Dr. McKibben and seconded by Mr. Hernandez. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 That was unanimous. With that, we are at item H, board reports. Are there any board reports at this time? We'll go through our lineup mostly so I don't forget anybody. Mr. Hernandez, any board reports? No board reports, but I do appreciate the discussion that we had tonight of ver in various times that we are going to put this topic COVID on our agenda item at the end of February. So I do appreciate that. And I think that is ap absolutely appropriate. Thank you, Mr. Hernandez. Ms. Costa? No, thank you. Ms. Creason? Um, just really spent the last couple of weeks on a lot of calls with parents. I do, as everyone knows, I spent a lot of time connecting with parents and students, um, but a lot more this past week. <laughs> and also really excited to explore universal design for learning. Um, had a great call with Kimber Rice, a uh, member of the CAC, involved parent and everything else, just Dynamo in the district, um, who is introducing me to universal design for learning and how that can be 
a model used for inclusion of our kids receiving special education services. But um, as I understand it, and I'm still diving in, you know, it really, the model can um, lead to broader inclusion beyond that specific demographic. So I'm just learning a lot and it's um, very interesting. So I just want to give a shout out to Kimber for bringing it to my attention. And I think that's about it. Thank you, Ms. Creason, Dr. McKibben. I'm good, thank you. Thanks, Dr. McKibben. Um, at this point, we are then at item I, future agenda items. Do any board members wish to add any items to the future agenda? Mr. Hernandez? No, thank Ms. Costa? Ms. Creason, Dr. McKibben? No. All right, so with that, we are at our final um, item and our final round of visitor comments, item J. Mr. Allen, are there any visitor comments at this time? Uh, we do have three hands raised at this time, and I would remind those who are attending with us on the Zoom meeting, this is our final opportunity for public comment tonight. So if you'd like to do so, we would ask that you click that raise hand button now found at the bottom of your screen. Um, and if we are ready, uh, President uh, Viasquez, uh, we can begin. We'll begin in just one moment. I'm going to do my brown act blurb. I would like to remind um, the members of the public that comments are limited to two minutes. Under the Ralph and Brown Act, the board is not allowed to comment on items that are not on the agenda. So we're not ignoring your comments. We just can't respond to any individual comments. The superintendent can refer items to staff who can follow up with you. And at this point, Mr. Allen, I invite you to take it away. Thank you, President Viasquez. Our first comment will be from Katie Reed, when you are ready. Thank you, board. My name is Katie Reed. I was a student in San Juan for 13 years. After law school, I convinced my Alaskan husband to remain in California to raise our children and buy a home in this district. We now have three boys with a combined 15 years in the district. Therefore, I'm speaking to you tonight with 28 years of experience in the San Juan Unified School District. I am humiliated by this past year and I'm disgusted at myself that I have let you lead me on with hopeful return to at least hybrid learning first in August, then in October, then in January, and now maybe March. We should have left this district this summer. Zima, I've specifically appreciated your speaking up tonight, but you're, you are incorrect that until noon today, we simply could not open up. You as a board have never even hinted at requesting a waiver for elementary schools, an option that you've had since July 17th of 2020. You refused to act quickly enough to get our children into in-person learning when we had a window in the fall preferring instead to push reopening to the much less likely ability in the middle of winter. You have made zero effort to discuss the potential of reopening our schools when the rates fall before 20, fall below 25 per 100,000 as allowed by Governor Newsom's safe schools plan, safe schools for all plan, a plan that he first proposed in December. We hit that number today, not surprisingly. Newsom specifically said that all aspects of his return to school plan are negotiable. So stop hiding behind county mandates this and the state mandates that and explain why you are really refusing to push hard for the earliest possible opening. <laughs> District educated me. I'm pretty smart. If you can't give me straight, believable, logical answers, it is crystal clear that your resistance is due only to the dollars you have all received from the teachers. Thank you for your comment. Our next comment will be from Ms. Alicia Nichols, when you are ready. Good evening. 
My name is Alicia and I work at San Juan High School. I want to thank every parent tonight that talked about their students' mental health. I too suffer from depression, anxiety, and a few other mental illnesses. I lost my best friend to suicide at the age of 15 in 2008. I work at San Juan High School and we're trying very hard to be there for your students during these hard times with our virtual wellness room that our counselors run and many students have told me that it's been helpful. Sadly, that number pales to how many tell me they are suffering right now. But as teachers and staff, we are suffering too. We are also depressed and anxious because of distance learning. We too want to go back, but not until it is safe for your children to be together in a classroom. I also hope that you remain as passionate about our children's mental health as you are right now, because when we do go back, we will need all hands on deck to try to reintroduce ourselves and our students back into the learning environment. We want these rules and regulations so that your children and family and that our families are able to stay safe. So I urge parents and board members alike to consider the safety of the entire community when making such an important decision like going back to school during a pandemic. I also urge the board to think back to the speech that I said earlier and to address the income inequity between certificated and classified employees, especially since we are below the poverty level during a pandemic. Thank you for your time. For your comment, our next comment will be from Judith Kerinsky Stevens, when you are ready. Good evening. Um, you've shared a lot tonight, so I'm going to hold off on making too many comments. Um, I do want to address two things. One, uh, Zima in particular, you will be hearing from me tomorrow regarding the attendance. It's been a huge issue. I'm now getting letters from the school district, despite the fact that my child is attending Zoom meeting. She is being marked absent because she has not quickly done the assignment that was being requested. Um, so she's been dinged for that, which means I have now been dinged for that, and I'll be following up with you. Um, the board could state tonight, they could do something. They could state tonight that they want our children back in school. I want my kids back in school. Everyone I know wants their kids back in school. And the board could say that the second they have the opportunity, they're going to get the kids back in school. Your plan should have been ready. We've been doing this for a long time now. This has been a long, long year for all of us, all of us. And your plan ought to be ready. So I'm not sure why Kent Kern thinks that you don't have a plan yet. And if you don't have a plan yet, that's what? disappointing. I don't believe that you're going back to school this year. I think that's the plan. Um, I hope that that's not true. But um, I'm going to digest everything that was said tonight, and you will all be receiving a letter from me. Thank you for your time. For your comment, our next comment will be from Sunny Darling. When you are ready. Sunny Darling, it looks like you are still on mute. If you are ready to give your comment, you are invited to unmute. Board members, with this two minutes, I hope to convey my absolute disappointment and disgust with San Juan Unified and the board chosen to represent it. My pre-collegiate years were all spent at San Juan Unified schools, and I thought that would be the case for my children. You must know of the growing number of families intending to leave our district if in-person school is not resumed and quickly. My question is, do you care? Do you care of the devastation this is doing to kids? The increase in missing children, increase in internet crimes against children, depression, isolation, academic regression. Do you care of the devastation to families as they are faced with choosing between educating their child and keeping their job? I no longer believe you care. I'm ashamed of our district. I'm ashamed of this board. You have not fought to return our children to school. You have missed opportunities that would have returned our children to school. You continuously refuse to adapt and adjust to the ever-changing guidelines and restrictions of COVID-19. You hide behind a government veil making promises that are buried in bureaucratic strings and paperwork. If this were private industry, you would all be experiencing a swift shift in management or flat out fired. It is an injustice to our community that parents that can afford to will drive a mile down the road from their public home school and attend private school in person. So much for educational equality. Those private schools have figured it out, why haven't you? You should be ashamed of yourselves. There are teachers that want to be in person. 
There are families that want to be in person. We should have a choice. Give us this choice. Give us this choice now. Show that you care. Thank you. For your comment, our next comment is from David Berry, when you are ready. Hi, uh, so I have been working for the district for about four years. Uh, my wife has worked for the district for about eight. Um, and I would just like to point out that we've been doing this for nearly a year, as I'm sure everyone is aware. We've been doing this for a year. We've been shut down since last March. Um, it's been hard on everyone. We have uh, an eight month old and a three year old and it is very difficult and I understand that. It would be more difficult uh, looking back to when I was in elementary school or junior high or high school, if my 60 to 70 year old teacher who was my favorite teacher, my beloved teacher got COVID because I went back to school early because we didn't have this all under control, I would feel devastated. You wanna talk about anxiety, depression, all these things. We now have a vaccine that's being rolled out terribly. It's being rolled out extremely poorly. We know that, we see it in the news, but we're there. We are literally in, in the last leg of this and people still don't understand that thousands of people are dying. This is not fake. You're, and it's, it's your, your aunts, your uncles, people in your family are at risk for this. And we've been doing it for so long at this point, going back now, just wouldn't make any sense. And I'm not saying that because I love working from home. I wouldn't mind being back in the office. My wife would love to be back in the classroom. These are true things. The other thing is that my dad in his seventies just got his first shot. I haven't seen him in months and he just got his first shot and I am not doing anything that will put him at risk. And if people cannot understand that people are dying and you will be able to catch up in your kid's education. I promise. People are dying in this country every day around the world. And you are so extremely selfish that you want to put your teachers, the staff, the secretaries, everyone at risk is beyond me. We need to stay closed until we get the staff vaccinated. Thank you. And thank you for your comment. And that is our final. Mr. Allen, you are on mute, but I think that that was you indicating that that was the end of, pub of the second round of public comment for the evening. It was. We are done. Okay. Well, with that, there are no further agenda items on our agenda, so we are adjourned for the evening. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you all for joining us tonight. The next regularly scheduled meeting of the Board of Education is set for February uh, 23rd. Uh, public session is anticipated to start at 6.30 p.m. and we do expect to be on the Zoom platform again. So www.sanjuan.edu slash board meeting for further details. Thank you again for joining us. Have a good evening.